I know. Um, yeah, we're live, and it's like <laughs> it's been a minute for it's, me too. <laughs> I, I just it's like it's crazy. Each uh, each week, I think I'm gonna sneak in um, an afternoon or something, but I just keep digging away and working on you know getting this house done. And like my wife said, she said, you know, once we get this all taken care of. Uh, we can go back to like some normalcy. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll tell you what though it's it's a good time it's a good time to not fish, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not like we're in the middle of a spawn or right. or, or fall. Yeah, you know? I'll take I'll take not fishing right now over not fishing in the spring or middle of fall. Yeah, I hit um, I think five different lakes last week. Did you really? Yeah. Nice. I've been hitting it really hard. We. We have these online tournaments and they're they're getting really competitive. So I've been pushing on that and I'm still not doing that great on it. I think I'm in like fourth place or something, but um, you just, <laughs> I mean, try, it's all about catching the big ones, you know? So I'm just going around trying to find somewhere that's got some big ones biting. So how's that online tournament work? It's your best five by length, of course, for the month. And you for can state? fish. Anywhere in Missouri, you can fish uh, any public water, and uh, yeah, I mean it's. I mean, you can fish Lake of the Ozarks if you wanted to, or you can fish the little MDC lake that's down the road. And obviously, like the MDC lakes are where it's at because right. those are the ones that have those. I mean, I have gone out and caught three or four over twenty inches on those uh, more than once, and um, it's hard to do that regularly. At, you know, the big lakes, they get pressured so much, but. Yeah. And right now, I mean, I, I guess, you know, the thing about Lake of the Ozarks is it does get a ton of boat traffic, but you can get in some of those no wake coves and, and fish during the daytime. It's not that big a deal, but as far as going from cove to cove, it's pretty hard to do that in the middle of the day in the summertime um, oh, yeah. in, a, in a big boat, let alone in a kayak. It's probably almost impossible in a kayak. There's so many good little lakes around that I just love. I mean, that it kind of forces me to go out and explore those. Um, like, there's so many uh, conservation lakes around that uh, most people, I mean, local people might know about them, but, I mean, some of them are great. So when you enter your, your catch on that online format, is there like a GPS dot where you where you entered that fish at then yeah it's it's uh you know tagged on the photo that like the tournament director can see that information and you can see it nobody else can see it okay um it's it's like that's you know obviously you don't really want people to know where you're catching your fish but um it's it's a <laughs> it's kind of a game though everybody's trying to figure out somebody gets hot and they're catching big ones everybody's trying to figure out where they're fishing at but um, yeah, the tournament director can see the exact time that you submitted it and where you submitted the fish at. It's just to verify, you know, that it's not a farm pond somewhere in somebody's some farmer's field or something like that. But well, that's that's what I was wondering. I mean, how how is it regulated? And that sounds like it's it's, it's regulated to the nth degree. Yeah, um, being public water like that. Uh, but essentially, somebody could win it in one one afternoon, right? Absolutely. I, I actually did. Um, in March, I went out, I drove back from Gunnersville. Oh, is it? Yeah. Gunnersville and, uh, or no. Yeah. So I went to Gunnersville. I didn't do great. I think I finished like 50th. I was kind of bummed and I came home and I actually stopped for it. I had been gone a week and I just stopped on my way into town at this conservation lake. And I caught like 99 inches or something like that in about an <laughs> hour and a half and won the monthly tournament um, and basically caught them all just right there on my way back into town. So wow. um, that was pretty cool, actually. Get get your mojo back when you do something like that. Heck no yeah. doubt, man. That's, I, I remember one time, I can't remember what tournament it was. It was, I think it was a Pickwick tournament. I think, I, I think it was a Toyota owner's tournament down at Pickwick. We just stunk it up. And I came back. And I had a couple hours to go fishing and I went to Lake Gerardo, believe it or not. 
and I caught a nice like five pounder on a Carolina rig, and I caught a, a couple other bites. And but I that's felt, a giant I felt, at that lake. It so. is. It was a really really good fit. I hadn't caught one that size in that lake in a long time, but it felt good to get the stink out of the boat, man. Because you know you have you have a bad outing, and it can weigh on you. I usually shake it off in a couple days, but you know there's a buildup. Anybody on here that fishes derbies or or even just going fishing in general. A lot of times there's a buildup and you're thinking about it all week long, especially if it's a weekend thing and you're kind of preparing mentally, maybe physically packing some stuff, depending on what kind of a trip it is. And you get out to the lake and maybe it's tough and you're like, dang, I, you know, I put all this mental energy into this and it was a tough time. It was supposed to be relaxing fun. The fish were supposed to be biting. I had it all figured in my head exactly what I was going to catch them on and where I was going to catch them. And it just didn't pan out. And then you got to, you got to sleep on that. So if you can go like, I tell you, you can, if you can go catch some fish right away, you're way better off. The one that gets even worse on that one is when you get back to the boat ramp and your buddy's sitting there and he's like, man, I, I butchered him today. I caught, you know, oh, 20, know. 25 pounds today. And you struggled all day long. It's like, <laughs> what did I do wrong? And that for me, that makes me just want to go right back out and, and start all over again. Like try to come back with a clean slate. They're but, always biting. Yeah, they're always biting. They're always, they always got to eat, right? I somebody's mean, somebody's catching them. They're they, maybe they're doing something. Maybe you're not that far away from doing what's what they're biting. Typically, that, time, you're oh, in the right areas. You're just not doing the right thing. Exactly. So you're fishing a little bit too shallow, or you're not fishing, you know, uh, wood, or it, you're you're picking apart the wrong kind of stuff, the wrong kind of bait. I mean, there's been times where it's really really tough, and and Chad, maybe this has happened to you, but you know, we we want to slow down want to pick up a worm or a jig or a tube or something and drag it around and pitch it. And then you talk to somebody and they just smoked them on like a chatterbait, yeah. <laughs> like a moving bait or, or crankbait. And you're like, you know, I, 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 I didn't recover just, water all day. Yeah, and there was no wind it was full sunshine. And you're like, okay, you got to fish a shaky head or something real slow. And they're out there just, you know, fishing moving baits and whacking on them. I used to do that, but like, I've kind of figured out like what you said that, when it's tough, I actually, sometimes you're better to fish faster because you are just looking for a fish that's willing to bite and get the bait in front of them. And you might just need to cover more water to find that fish and just throw, I mean, I'll throw something more finesse like a small square bill crankbait or something. Uh, like, you know, Fritz side five is like my, been my go-to for a couple of years now. And you can just, I mean, it worked for me at Truman this year, just uh, last month, I think. Um, it was super tough. I was having a hard time getting a bite. And I, I just was almost to the point of like, I'm just ready for this day to be done. And I just, I was like, I'm just going to throw the fritz side because I, I like throwing it. And I mean, literally within five minutes, I caught big bass of the tournament. Um, so it was like 20 and a half inches and it was just suspended in a tree in that fritz side, you know, just got it in front of it, I guess. But, um, you know, sometimes slowing down and trying to finesse them with a, with a bottom or a slow moving bait is, is not the deal, even when it's tough. Yeah. I, th I think there, th there's a lot of truth to that. Sometimes it's just, they're not feeding. And the only thing that gets them, to take the bait is a, a, like a pure reaction strike. You're actually forcing them to, to grab that bait when it goes by them. Um, and then there's other times where they're like, like a school of bass on a point or something or a hump or some kind of ledge. You can see the fish and they're down there and they won't hit a crankbait, but they will hit something like a drop shot or something like a really light shaky head. So, um, there, there's a difference in locating fish and having fish found and making those two different types of fish bite. So if you, if you've got those fish found, you can really kind of just go through a rotation of baits and hopefully one of them, you know, one of them will work. But if you're, if you're hunting and pecking and you're fishing slow, it's going to take you all day to, to find a group of fish. And then, you know, I, like you said, if you're throwing a, a flat side or some kind of crankbait, that's that's the way to go for sure. Absolutely. Can you fish like creeks? Do they consider creeks public waterways? Yeah, absolutely. Creek streams, um, anything inside of any public body of water in the bounds of Missouri. Yep. Yep. Rivers are fair game. Awesome. Awesome. You posed a question as we as we opened up tonight, and 
So what's working for you? So yeah, what's working for everybody out there? Because obviously for, for there. you and I, it's nothing is working right now. Chad, what's working for you right now? Um so this week, um, like I, I said earlier, I think I fished five lakes in the last week and uh I throw a little spinner bait um a lot. Um and uh the zapper jig is always like a go-to and lately the that tube that crackigator tube that's been that was that's been a key for me for like a couple months and i had some some places where i knew there was fish and i knew there was big fish but they were they're like super pressured they get there's a lot of pressure on those that one particular little lake and um I would get a lot of bites, but they would just nip at the bait. And a lot of times if I would throw a worm, they would bite, like they would bite the worm and I'd set the hook and they tear, you know, the worm would tear in half and they wouldn't get the hook. And uh, so I started throwing that tube and I was just like every probably three or four casts, I would squirt some, some scent up inside the tube. And then I was like working it through uh, like wood and brush piles and stuff and it's just super slow and they would eat that tube and i would be able to hook them whereas like well just about every other even a straight tail worm they were like i'd set the hook and they would literally just have half the worm and would tear it in half so hmm. um you know i know you fish the tube a lot too but that's man it's it's for me it's a go-to when the bite's really tough it's funny because the next video that i'm gonna be dropping is a tube video um, I've been working on it for a while and I just because I haven't had the opportunity, I've been working so much and then, you know, dealing with this house, I just ha I have not been able to keep a consistent video regimen. It's just the way it is. But the next one's going to be a, a tube a tube video. And you're right. There's something special about a tube and it's it's super underutilized. There's all these fancy soft plastics that are out there now. And that tube is just it's become something that i have a ton of confidence in when the fishing is tough um there's a lot a lot of reasons for it you know one obviously is the not a lot of people fish it so they haven't seen it as much and two is just the finesse profile it's like a basically the size of a ned rig like a fat ned rig for the most yeah. part um and it's got that that gliding kind of spiral fall depending on how you um, rig it up but it's a it's a killer bait and i'm excited to drop that video i think i'm gonna hopefully i'll be able to drop it friday but i just kind of break down a couple different tech a couple different styles of fishing tube and you know i i really think that it's something that everybody on here if you're not fishing a tube you definitely need to be checking it out because it's it's a really good warm weather it's a good it's even good in the winter it's good all year long but Right now, there's something about it when they're not biting other baits. They seem to seem to take that tube and get it all the way down their mouth. Yeah, I've been fishing it mainly just Texas rigged, and uh, I've had really good luck with that. Um, I've started like I use a like a big EWG hook, and I like bend the hook point out a fairly good amount, like probably over five degrees, so that. I mean, you can still like skin hook it, um, but it's like you have to be kind of careful when you're working it through cover because it, it will pop out of there. But that's what I want I, because, you know, the tube's kind of notorious, especially Texas rig for like not getting good hookups sometimes because it'll ball up and stuff right. like that. But I don't I have not had any trouble this year. And I've been doing that where I I've also been using like a mustad grip pin hook. And it holds that the tube on, it keeps it from sliding down the hook as much. And um, they're just really good solid hooks. And I'll bend that hook point out and I don't have too much trouble, but I need to get more experience fishing that stupid tube that you do a lot. Yeah. And um, I've been talking to Joey about, we need to like make a head because in my mind, the heads that are out there, are, the, the hooks are too small for the bigger tubes in, in a lot of them. And, uh, and I know you've got kind of a connection to get some good ones, but, um, but a lot, a lot of the ones I've tried to buy, I think the best I've found is like, I 
think a company called four by four. Yeah. Um, I found it on tackle warehouse. Those seem like they were pretty good, but I just don't, I haven't fished them a lot yet. I'm actually going to be headed up to uh, Wisconsin. I leave tomorrow. I'm going to be up there for four or five days and I may play with the stupid tube a little bit up there, but, um, you know, I know that's a good way to catch them too. There's yeah, a, but the, oh, go ahead. I was going to say the thing about the stupid tube and anybody that's tried this will know what I mean. If, if you have the wrong shape of the lead, it needs to be round lead because if a lot of them have that teardrop and when you take the hook in and you put the two, the weight inside and you make that turn to turn that lead around to the, to, to be forward, if the lead is oblong, it's too tall and it tears the tube out where something that's in a circle just slides right in. Now, the actual stupid tube brand, their tubes are really slimy and really kind of elastic. So it, it will work in that brand of tube, the actual stupid tube head, which is more of the oblong. But yeah. for something like the crocagator tube, you need something that's round because they're more of a double or maybe a triple dip tube i'm not sure exactly but they have a little bit thicker wall and they're a little bit harder plastic yeah they're more durable um and, and if you just have a teardrop shape you're gonna mess up the tube and, that, and that's been frustrating i phil meyer who i don't i'm not sure if he's on here or not but i was telling him about the stupid tube several years ago and he kept tearing his tubes out he ordered some of the heads and he was just having all kinds of problems and i'm like it, it's super easy dude just run it in there i was assuming that he had the jig head that's round, round head yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know what he's talking about i'm like there's nothing to it you know and and i went fishing with him one day he threw me a pack of those lead heads and he's like here smart ass real rig them up you know and i'm like <laughs> i'm like okay and i and sure enough it's that that oblong thing and i could not no matter even if i pulled it and i you know i lubricated it i could not get it to slide hmm. so that round head is is the key, and that's the not the tube. so that's not the part that you want to rip. For me, on a stupid tube, I want the where you're poking the hook through and you're text posing it. I want all that. I'll run that hook in and out of that that area on a stupid tube four, five, six times to get it where it it slides really easy on that. If you've got uh, your if you've got your hook point right, it'll lay right on the back of the yep. stupid tube. You don't really yep. even have to text pose it, and that's like you said, Chad. That's if you're using an EWG, you got to bend it out a little bit or you're going to lose a lot of fish. Well, the ones that we use, they have a real short. They're like a kale style. Yeah. Almost. They're, they're really, they really come back in like yeah. that. But, but they're yeah, real gotta, short, short on the, mm -hmm. the, the bend part. It doesn't yeah. have a long barb area. Right. So, so that's, that's, that's one of the key things. And, and also with the uh, tube is um, not going so deep into the plastic. Like I watched a video of Bill Lowen years ago and he, and he goes in just like an eighth of an inch and it, basically where you got your, your line tie and then the notch, like the J bend or whatever you want the, the, the point of the, the tip of the tube kind of in that little notch right there. Right. Not all the way up on the eye. You want the eye. Yeah, yeah. Out of you want the eye kind of sticking out and that, that keeps that tube from sliding back down and balling up on your hook. And that that's two little things that make a huge difference when you're fishing with a tube. I'll tell you, Chad, for Texas rig on your tubes, try the owner EWG wide gap plus. I have some of those. Okay. Yeah, I've actually those are great because yeah, they've got a huge bite on them. Those are those are really good too. Yep. Um I I've just started I play was playing with those uh mustad grip pen hooks this year and and it's been it's been good for me too. But before that I did use that that wide gap plus owner. Okay. And uh, I think, and obviously, I've got a really good point on them too, so you get good hook penetration. And Almost too good because the point, if you hit a rock or anything with that, it'll you roll. Catch, you catch a bone, it'll roll. Yeah, yeah. Those are made in uh, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and this, yeah. then there, there's like another, like I, I feel like it hasn't been talked about much, but it, it's man, it's a great way to rig that tube. Is um, Crocagator has, uh, it's called the uh, Gator Lock Jig Head, and it's got a great big beefy hook in it. It's got a like a little clip to when you when you slide that 
uh, tube on there, it'll keep it from sliding down. And it's more like a jig where it's got a weed guard. So that hook's exposed. And, and it's, it actually was kind of originated at Lake of the Ozarks for like skipping docks. And, um, I've used it for that. I mean, that, that head works great for people put brush hogs and beavers and everything else on them too. But, but the tube works great on there for, um, for working around docks. And then you don't, I mean, you get great hookups with that and it's still, it's still weedless. So, um, that's another great way, uh, to fish the tube. And I don't, I feel like some people maybe kind of forgot about that, but. Yeah, I, I, I've got some of those and I haven't fished them yet, but it makes total sense. It's going to keep that tube up there for sure. Um, what's up, Matty Wong? Good to see you on here, brother. Flipping a tube is the deal. Um, Stephanie, had a Doug says, up there. yeah, Doug says the shaky head 5.25 crocodile June bug worm. It's been working for him, and Doug got back in the check line recently. So, congratulations! I saw it was good work. Yeah, Stephanie says, um, how do you navigate in a kayak on lakes such as Lake of the Ozarks? She says, I couldn't even imagine. Well, um, I don't know if she means just like due to like the boat wakes. Um, that'd, that'd be my guess. Yeah. I mean, it, it all depends on your kayak because there's such a wide range of kayaks that people use. And I'm in probably one of the, the widest, uh, most stable kayaks that's out there. Um, the old town autopilot 136. it's 13 and a half foot kayak. And, uh, about 40 inches wide and it's almost like i mean it almost feels to me like you're in like a small boat versus a kayak but um it handles big water really well and you know some people fish out of 10 foot kayaks that you might buy at bass pro or academy sports and and they they do good too but usually it, the people that are in those type of smaller paddle kayaks or pedal kayaks that maybe aren't quite as stable they're gonna look for uh, more protected areas way back way up in creeks and the backs of coves and stuff where you don't have all the boat wakes like lake of the ozarks but i'm i'm probably i probably push the envelope as much as anybody as far as rough water i mean i i've, I've crossed the main channel at lake of the ozarks in the, the middle of the day and stuff and it's you know a little sketchy sometimes but I've never had any trouble. I'm more worried about somebody like hitting me like a boater or something like yeah. that. I keep, I keep an air horn. Like in, when I'm in places like that, I keep an air horn handy. Actually I used it on somebody one day, but um, you know, you, you just gotta, everybody has their own comfort, comfort level, but um, you know, Lake of the Ozarks is probably one of the worst lakes that we fish as far as boat traffic. Um, that around here anyway have you ever been what's some of the sketchiest situations you've been in in a kayak that come to mind uh well as far as like rough water the worst was wilson lake in kansas that was my my first year and i went about two miles away from the boat ramp and it was a beautiful day and literally like it was calm. There was almost no wind at all. I never even had a second thought about it. And within like 20 minutes, all of a sudden this like wind kicked up out of nowhere. You know, I guess that's Kansas for you. But the next thing I know, it's blowing like 30 miles an hour directly uh, the wrong direction of the lake for, you know, it was, it was blowing down the lake and it was blowing from the direction I needed to go to get back to the boat ramp. And I had like, I mean, I don't know. You you estimate at least three foot, I think maybe some four foot, but at least three foot rollers out there. And they were just breaking like over the bow and like my whole cockpit would fill with water and it would get, the scuppers, it drains out really quick, but you're just soaked. And um, I just, for an hour, it took me an hour to get back to the boat ramp. And I was just going right into these rollers all the way back to the boat ramp. There were people that got into trouble um, in other kayaks, different parts of the lake that day, they had to, you know, just beach their kayak and then figure out how to get it back. 
to the, you know, to their trailer or, um, you know, some people flipped and stuff like that. But that was probably the, like the worst conditions as far as how rough it was. I mean, I've been out in, yeah, I don't know if you guys saw that video at Stockton, you know, it was Palm de Terre this year. Uh, one of the guys had a video that, that went viral, but there was like a uh, baseball size hail coming down. Yeah, that and was, I was nuts. That's nuts. I was, I was out in that. Luckily I, I kind of knew it was coming and I was in a part of the lake where I found some boat docks and I was able to get underneath boat docks. Yeah. But you know, that actually that morning, uh, there was some wicked lightning that I was out in that too. And you know how it is, you know, you, everybody knows you shouldn't like be out there on the water when it's lightning, but sometimes there's like, you just, you can't always anticipate how it's going to play out. And uh, if you, you know, you, you'd never, a lot of times you wouldn't go fishing at all. If you, if you, every time there was a chance you didn't go anyway, I was out there a couple miles from the ramp and some wicked lightning came up and it was, I was puckering up pretty good, but, um, Hmm. And then later that afternoon, it was the same day that we had that that terrible hail, and a lot of guys got their trucks totaled and stuff like that. But uh, those are some pretty bad situations. So, what what about what about animals? Like, have you had any altercations with snakes or beavers or deer, anything like that? I mean, I haven't really. I mean, there's definitely been snakes, but I've never had one come in the boat. Um, I'm pretty aware i try to be aware of it and i'm always paranoid when i see one that they're going to crawl in behind me and i'm not going to see it um but uh (laughs) you know um i haven't fished too much around gators yet although we have some an an event later this year that's got some gators um i mean i've been pretty fortunate um you know i haven't had too many encounters with wildlife. My my fishing partner hooked a beaver um, when we were at Truman, and uh, he literally he had a shaky head on, and he set the hook, and he's like, "All right, I got a good one," you know. And <laughs> then all of a sudden, he's like, "This is this isn't a, I don't know, this isn't a bass, whatever it is." Well, he fought it, and finally, like it came up, and it was he saw it was a beaver. And, you know, he tried, there wasn't a lot he could do, ended up breaking his line off. And then literally the beaver came back out and he saw it and it had the shaky head in the corner of his mouth. So he literally bit the shaky head. No, nope. but yeah. Um, yeah, that was a weird deal. So, um, I, yeah, you know, I mean, I've been lucky having anything like that yet. But. There's a guy local that he had the same thing. He, he set the hook on one. I think his was just he swam through and hit him. And when he hit it, the be- I guess the beaver was already in motion and ripped the rod out of his hand. <laughs> and of, of course, you know, you, you stick some, somebody it's sticks like a hook 60 in 60 pound animal, like yeah. a, a big one. You stick a hook in their side, they're, they're going to freak. And he freaked out and he took off towards the bank. He said all he saw was his rod, like after he got up on the bank, just dragging up through the woods. And finally, he <laughs> saw the line snap, walked up there, grabbed his rod, and went back. But like, it was <laughs> crazy. It, happen- it happens like that, right? I mean, you set the hook and he, he bolts and you're just. Ooh, gone there goes the rod so, yeah usually it's a i couldn't imagine usually it's like a catfish i remember that happening several times as a kid when you're bank fishing you know with uh some bj stink bait oh yeah, it's late oh, at yeah. Night, all of a sudden your rod just goes shooting in the lake and it's over it happens, happens it i'd be i'd be worried about beavers because you know even in a like an our john boat or a bass boat they can get pretty aggressive like smacking their tails pretty close to the boat and yeah i mean I don't know. I'd, I'd just be nervous. I don't know if it falls into the wildlife category, but uh, last weekend, actually, I was at a like one of the conservation lakes here in Missouri, and it's it's got some houses on it and boat docks and stuff. And I was cruising down the middle of the lake, and I saw something up ahead. And I actually, I couldn't tell what it was. I, at first, I thought it was like maybe like a deer that was swimming across the lake. And I got closer, and it was a woman. And I'm, I'm talking like pretty far off the bank right out in the middle of the main part of the lake and i was like what the heck and so i'm getting closer and she didn't know i was coming because my kayak i'm not making any noise and she she turned around as i got closer and saw me and she like stuck her arm up i didn't know if she she thought i was going to hit her or something and 
you know, I, I acknowledged her. And as I got closer, uh, you know, she was like, man, I didn't even hear you coming. And I said, well, yeah, I saw you. I didn't know what it was. And well, I, I figured out pretty quick she was naked and she was swimming out there in the middle of the lake. And so that was just really weird, you know, and I guess my I, I didn't know where she came from. And uh, so I'm like, just, you know, like kind of going on. I'm going to go fishing. I start fishing down the bank and I'm of course, I'm distracted now. I keep turning around looking to see where this lady's at out in the middle of the lake. And she was swimming around doing like these porpoise things and swimming under the water. And I'm fishing around this dock. Mermaid. And um, I guess the dock was hers. And I didn't realize it. And so she was like waiting for me to get by before she came back into the dock. But, um, you know, here I am. I'm like trying to fish and I, I keep miss, missing fish because I like turned around and was like looking to see where she was at. And the next thing I know, my line is swimming off. I missed the fish. And so that was kind of a weird deal. You know, I kind of the I've never had anything like that happen before. But. Did you li did you live scope her? <laughs> no, just, that would have been cool, though. <laughs> That's perfect time for forward facing sonar. That would be good. That'd be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> You never know what you're going to see out on the lake. It's, I've seen, I've seen deer like big bucks, like big deer swimming across the lake, and it's similar to what you saw. I mean, you saw a person; it was a female swimming across the lake. But I'll see something off in the distance, and you know, go up on it. it kind of like it, a lot of times, it's right at dusk. Yep. You just kind of see like an outline of something. You can't really tell what it is, and it'll be. You know, I've seen like 10, 12 point bucks. I've seen a couple of does swimming across. I've a uh, guy I know sent me a picture of a bobcat, a huge bobcat. This was on Cedar Lake for people on here that fish Cedar Lake. And this thing was trying to get in his boat. He saw it swimming. I can't remember if he, if he was on the trolling motor or they were on the big motor. I want to say he was on the trolling motor fishing and he saw it swimming, didn't pay a lot of attention to it. And it kept, it got closer and closer to the boat and it was trying to get into the boat. I guess it was maybe he was seeking refuge. It was wore out and they had to get away from it. And it was swimming very fast. And it yeah. was a, he's got a picture, this big old head, like a big old sticking on the head of the boat, big old head, not too far from the boat, like <laughs> 10 feet from the boat. I had, and you uh, can tell like he's coming in hot. I guess it was two years ago. It was e evening, dusky dark. And I kept hearing a deer, like a ma, a a uh, uh, doe bleat up in the woods and that's like a for a deer hunter that's a distinct sound right you know that sound anywhere and it was you could hear it here and then you'd hear it over here and then you'd hear it over here and finally i got close enough and i, I saw her running back and forth well i noticed between me and her there was something in the water making a v at me and it was her fawn oh and i mean I, this was probably couple months old maybe she was you know i could have picked her up and stuck her under my arm uh, but i just trolled over to her and kind of steered her back towards the bank and finally got her back towards the bank after probably 20 minutes of you know you're trying to corral a wild animal that has no clue what you're trying to do and got her back up on the bank and back with mom and they took off she shook off like it was nothing but she was out in the middle of the lake and there was folks running down the lake and you know, all you got is two little ears sticking up She's yeah. going to get plowed. Yeah, you so. could easily hit them. Um, B. Kelly says, Gabe, have you fished from a kayak before? Would you ever try being a plastic horse Monty? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what? Um, I have fished out of a kayak with JB. Yeah. At Kentucky, Kentucky, Lake. Kentucky Lake. Was that your first time? I think that was my first time. In a kayak? No, I've been in a kayak before. I, I fished out of canoes a lot. Okay. Maybe it was the first time I've actually ever fished. Yeah, I think it was the first time I fished. It wasn't very good for it. us that night. No, we we got what an hour and a half in. Yeah, it, it was, was after fun. A tournament. It was fun, um, but that's really the only time I fished out of a kayak. I've been in them a few different times. Speaking of kayaks, I floated this weekend. Did you? Yeah, we right were on the Black River. Oh, I saw pictures. Yeah, outside yeah. of Piedmont. I bet uh, it was. Uh, I bet that was a good time. Dude, I'm ready to go back. Yeah. Um, I think the wife has convinced me that now I have to invest in kayaks. So. Because uh, we borrowed some kayaks from friends of ours. And it was a lot of fun. I did not take a fishing rod. I guess that was probably a giant mistake. But because uh, I did see some pretty good sized smallmouth swimming around in the river. Uh, but 
not knowing and not knowing the conditions of the river after all the rain that we had got the past weekend, I was not willing to to sacrifice rods and gear for. Yeah, you, know, you flip something and it's, it's gone. all gone. It's right? gone. I've lost stuff before. So I was like, you know, what? I'll get get an idea of what the river's like and if it is possible that I could take a a, a fishing rod. And, and let's be honest, if if you got four people and the uh, objective is to have fun and and fl- their objective is to float. They don't want to sit around and wait on you to to stop at every fishing hole. And it would have been it would have been way after dark before we got back. <laughs> yeah, I, that's how it was with me. I I took we did a camp out. Well, it wasn't a camp out. It was uh we rented a house in Van. I think it was Van Buren, and it was my sister and her boyfriend came in from California. My brother and sister in law from St. Louis. There was there was like 16, 20 people. There. Yeah. And we were right by the river and they would float, you know, float down and get picked up. And I floated down in the tube. I brought a rod. I just brought a spinning rod with a, um, uh, I think I had a tube on there actually, a little small tube. And I would, they would be, they would go two trips and I would still be making my way down. Cause I just pull over on a sandbar and, and just really soak the little holes mm-hmm. and the little pins. And so, yeah, if you're doing like a family thing where you need to be with the family, don't take a fishing rod because you're going to get sidetracked. And you're probably going to get in trouble. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I fish so slow on the river. Um, I I have a hard time fishing with other people because I fish, I, I probably fish too slow, but it's just, um, yeah, it, it's a totally different deal when you're floating versus fishing on a river. <laughs> Uh, Andy wants to know the dot coordinates of the naked female that you encountered the other day. Yeah, I don't know. I, I want to keep that one to myself, I think. There's some waypoints you got to keep to yourself. It's just the way it is. We share a lot on this channel. So, so, some so stuff just hold on, hold on. better left unsaid. What units do you have on your boat? I have a Helix 10. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm pr- pretty familiar with Lawrence. I'm not super familiar with Humminbird. What is the icon for that on your graph? <laughs> for the for the naked woman? Yeah, it's the, it's the mud flap, the chrome is it, mud I, flap. I, I thought there may be a hump one. Like, is it just a, a, a double hump or something like that on there? <laughs> just a big exclamation point. Yeah. Stop. There's stop sign. Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> Oh Lord. Yeah, Stephanie nailed it there. What's the one thing that will stop a man from? from fishing a naked yeah. a naked lady in the lake yep. i think it was a mermaid i really do um they're they're out there and you see them or a siren you know it was probably trying to tempt you you know luckily you were so focused on fishing and yeah she was probably speaking something real softly and you couldn't hear because you were just focused yeah so that's good yeah i've had i haven't had snakes in my boat um if I had a kayak, that would be a concern. I've had them attempt to and had to uh, coax them away. Uh, I had one drop in the boat one time. Um, well, it was on Lake Gerardo. I got hung up um, underneath an, an overhanging tree. And I was coming in. It was summertime, and I was shaking it, shaking it. And I got underneath this tree branch. And it was I wasn't touching it, but it was probably... Oh, I don't know about a foot taller than me, but I, I was kind of, I was kind of hunkered over a little bit too. So I don't know. It's probably like six, seven feet above the boat. And I got up in there and all of a sudden I heard a, like a thump in the back of the boat. This is in my John boat. And I thought a tree branch or something fell out and I, and I turned around and it was a snake had fallen out of the tree, hit the back of my boat. And as I looked, it was squirming across the deck and it shot over the side and went back in the water. It did its but part. It was it was dense enough that I actually heard a thump. Uh-huh. And I was like, thank you, Lord, that it did not go it towards was, the front of the boat and it went. Well, you out see, of the boat. see, that's not that's not my concern. Like that it disappears and you it disappears it. inside the boat and you don't know where the where yeah. the hell it's and at. You have to you have to you have to run the boat and you're sitting back there. Yeah. Oh, that would be tough. Man, I was yeah. down at Lake Conway this spring and we were fishing a tournament. There was a lot of the like the Arkansas guys down there fishing that tournament. And there was this guy came back to the ramp and he was fishing out of a kayak. And he's like one of those Arkansas good old boys. And he pulls this snake. He killed it. Uh, He said he beat it to death, I guess with his paddle. I don't know, but he pulled this snake out 
and he held it up and and i kid you not i mean the thing was like that big around he held it like over his head and the and the tail of the snake was dragging on the ground he oh, threw it wow. into the back of his buddy's truck and it went all the way across the bed of the truck i mean that was like the biggest snake i have ever seen in person in my life and if that thing would have fell in my boat because that's what he said he said it fell out of a tree into his boat I would, I, I would just be out. I'd be out of the, the kayak. No way. I don't know what I would do, but that, that was crazy. How fast can, have you, have you timed yourself? How fast you can bail out of one? Uh, <laughs> I, I bet it would be pretty fast. I haven't done it yet, but well, I, I don't know. See, that's the downside of a kayak is like, you don't really have anywhere to go. Uh -uh. You're sitting down and it's not like you can go to the front of the boat or go to the well, back of the boat. You have an old town, right? Yeah. So that, that old town's pretty stable. So you can, stand up and you got 13 dance, feet to, to 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 dance with him but I, i've literally like i have two cr uh, tackle crates in the back and one time i well more than once but one time i did this to get unhung i i, I hung my crankbait and the flag on the back of the boat the only mm -hmm. way i could get it unhung was i actually crawled and stood on my tackle crates in the back of the boat and got the the crankbait out of the flag so i if, if i had to i'd definitely be climbing back there or something but a snake that big i don't even know where you could go you know I, you might just have to bail yeah do you keep a paddle with you yeah for okay. sure i don't use it a lot but but i always have one gotcha david said he had to use it he was night fishing on cedar and he had a snake climb on his in his kayak non-poisonous he smacked it with the paddle so there's a 101 uses of a paddle. I guess that, that's the that's the difference. I mean, we're in John boats, so we're close to the water, but you're like at one with the water, right? You're yeah, they can just slide right up into yeah. the, the vessel. I had one one time I was um I was fishing on cedar and it was a I've told I've told this story, I think, but it's been a long time ago. But it was a it was a little green snake. I was out off this point, and I think this was before I had spot lock, so pre-ultra X. And I saw this snake swimming about halfway between the tip of the point in my boat. Um, it was a small green snake. I didn't think too much about it. So I'm making another cast and I kind of got focused on my cast. And all of a sudden I remembered, hey, there was a snake swimming. I need to look back and locate it and see where it's at. And I looked and I could, it was, it was gone. I didn't know where it was. So I'm like, okay, it's got to be swimming out the other side of the boat. So I look over to my right side of the boat. I don't see it anywhere. And I'm like, I'm kind of getting nervous. Like, where, where is it? Where's it at? Maybe it's just, I figured it was just leaning like maybe in the shade of my boat or something, just kind of hanging out there. I'm kind of looking around. I'm looking around. I go to the back of the boat. I look down below my outboard. I don't see it. I walk back up and I just kind of finished my retrieve. I was dragging a jig or a worm or something. And all of a sudden I look up on my trolling motor and right over the head of my trolling motor, like here's the head of my trolling motor. There was this little, <laughs> a little head of this green snake just looking at me. He had crawled up the shaft of my trolling motor oh, and he was just chilling. So I took my rod tip and I just kind of poked him and he just kind of went on his own merry way. But, you know, if that would have been a rattlesnake or Talk a about. water mock, yeah, exactly. It might have been different, but I was just lucky it was a small little green snake. Uh, I'm going down to Wapapello uh, end of August and my – my fishing partner's from down there and he said that the cotton mouse are just really thick and aggressive down there. So you have a short least. paddle that you'll carry with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or a pistol. I'll probably shoot a hole in my boat, but, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah, add some more. What, what were those? The scuppers? Yeah. <laughs> add a few more scuppers. <laughs> right. Um, Let's see. Okay, Andy's got a question. Got a kayak question. Right? Yeah, we're doing the Tuesday night thing. Andy made a reference earlier. He thought it was Monday night, and um, we talked about this last week. And Monday's just been Monday's been chaotic for me for the last year. It's it's our busiest day for the postal service of the week. I say that, but it's been like busy every day. Um, well, but, you guys are still recovering from. Yeah, and then UPS is talking about going on strike. If they go on strike, it's going to be bananas. It's already. Ever since Prime Day, people yeah. just have not quit ordering. Lost I think it, I think it triggered that inner online shopper in everybody, and they've just they're just they haven't they haven't got over that theme, and they just keep ordering stuff. So it's been 
bonkers. Uh, so yeah, I decided to, to change it to Tuesday and we're going to try this for a little while and um, see how it works. But Andy was saying, Oh, one more thing. We are going to be doing a Crockett Gator giveaway. So most of you are familiar with how that works. I do see some new faces in here. So I'll fill you in sometime during the stream coming up pretty soon. We are going to make a reference to a Sasquatch. We've been all around it. We've been talking about uh, all kinds of animals and crazy things that happen in boats. So we'll make that reference here. And I actually saw Darius was trying to yep, get me to I pull the trigger that on that. He was trying to get me to pull the trigger on it, but I'm not going to say the word. But um, when when we do that, guess a number between 1 and 200. Chad's given us a number. If you won last week, you're not eligible this week. We're going to start doing that to where we can space it out. That way it gives everybody a chance to win. So a number between 1 and 200 when we make a reference to Sasquatch. And you're going to win a really nice Crocagator Bait Company giveaway. Joey has given away several packages over the she years always and she out. really goes all out it'll be one of the best uh giveaways that you'll see on on any live stream i promise you she she this uh, one this one's going to be special too because um I, we've got a couple of new baits that are going to be released later this year that uh, i think we're going to talk about later tonight but um, Joey said we're, she's going to go ahead and put some of those unreleased baits Ooh. In, in this prize pack. So you will get them before anybody else. I am so glad I know the number. Yeah. So if you're, <laughs> if you're watching, I didn't every, win last week, <laughs> every, everybody on here, share, share this, share this on your social media feed, please. We need to get some more people in here. Um, this has been a great conversation and we got more to come. Chad has really been tearing up the kayak scene. So, we're going to dive into a little bit of more fishing type stuff and um, some tournament I'm, tactics. I'm curious and, to see these new propagator baits. Yeah, I know. And we're going to we're going to tease it just a little bit longer. And I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing it too. But Andy had a question before I got into that little rant. What battery do you use? Um, so I use well, actually I have two different batteries um, because I I have one for my electronics and one for my trolling motor, and both of them are lithium uh, for my trolling motor. I use an amped outdoors uh, lithium battery. I, I've got two of them now because I fish so much. I just, I like to have a backup, but I've got a hundred amp hour and an 80 amp hour. And, you know, that's about the size of a group 31 uh, deep cycle battery, but it only weighs, I think 25 or 26 pounds, something like that, which is key for a kayak to have a lightweight battery like that. And then they're also, of course, have so many advantages um, as far as, you know, the power stays constant instead of as the voltage drops, you start to lose power and, and how long they last, you know, they'll last for five, six years. So there's a lot of advantages to those. They're expensive, but um, Everhart's Outdoors, where I got mine, uh, they carry amped outdoor batteries and uh, they have a good selection of them. But um, I... You know, for my electronics battery, I have a smaller one. It's a 50 amp hour. And that, that just is dedicated to my uh, Helix 10. And then I also have a Mega Live unit. And then it also runs my, I have navigation lights. And then I also, I installed like a little uh, USB port for charging and plugging in my camera and stuff like that. And then I have some other lights in the kayak. And so it all, the electronics battery runs all that stuff. I have a power pole micro on the back and, you know, the Minn Kota heading sensor and all them little things, you know, that take power off that battery. Your kayak is pimped out, man. I remember checking it out at the, uh, the sports show. And yeah. It's Collins, got basically everything that a, a bass boat has, but just in a smaller package and everything's <clears throat> one thing I, I, I was amazed when I, when I spoke with you and, or we had a conversation and I looked at your kayak is how, how everything has its place. You, you got a lot, you got less real estate, you know, real estate is limited. So everything is purposed for a certain, certain situation. And it's all it's handy. Right? It's all customized to fit certain little spaces. It's pretty cool. And there's a lot of ingenuity that goes into uh, kayak stuff, you know, yeah. That, is that, did you, did you get that kayak that way? Do, do they sell it set up that much or do you buy like, like, 
I, I guess what I'm asking is, I, I was going to ask this earlier, is if somebody's wanting to get into kayak fishing, is there like base models that you buy and then you add stuff to it? Or can you go all out and buy like a full package? I mean, so they, they come basically that auto, the old town autopilot comes with uh, the kayak itself, the seat and the trolling motor. And basically that's it. And you don't have, I mean, there's, there's like a few, there's like a few basic like gear tracks and stuff like that, but um, you don't have like any like lights or electronics or um, all the, all the various accessories. I mean, it kind of comes somewhat ready for that. Like they've got uh, through hole uh, or through hull uh, places where you can run your wiring and, and stuff like that. But there's a lot of rigging that goes into setting it up. Like I have it set up and, if you don't, I mean, you can do, pretty much have to do it yourself or there are places that will do it for you, but I'm sure it'd be pretty expensive. Just like a, just like a bass boat, you know, you can install the electronics yourself or you can take it somewhere and have them install it for you, but they're going to charge you like a hundred bucks an hour to do it or whatever. But, um, but you know, kayaks, so it's, I used to rig my own, uh, bass boat. I've had several, uh, fiberglass bass boats and, you know, Rigging a kayak is so much more fun because it can be a real pain in the butt to run some of that wiring and stuff on a bass boat, oh, yeah. trying to fish it through the hull and stuff. And a kayak is just so much easier. And, you know, just I, I kind of enjoy doing that stuff. And it's it's not super hard. It's just kind of time consuming. And, you know, you got to think through how you want to set everything up. But it's not really it's not really that hard, um, you know, so. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of rigging involved. They don't they don't come like that. I'd say it's probably Jonathan and I have both customized our our John boats. We both have 16 foot aluminums and when we've Multiple had ones. and we yeah exactly we, we've customized them. And so I'd say it's kind of like bass boat or glass boat, then aluminum boat, and then a kayak as far as ease of rigging stuff. Because I know a John boat is pretty easy to rig stuff too, depending on. But even on the you, complexity you, you, of your, what you're doing, because we're adding hatches and lids and that's true. And but I mean, as far that. as running wire, yeah, I, I remember. I remember when I got my Ranger. I it had really old Hummingbird stuff, like 998, really small graphs, and I wanted to upgrade to like a Lawrence nine and a twelve. And running that wire, like you said, Chad, was crazy difficult yeah. trying to get. Just trying to, you just, it was just so hard to run it through. That's all blind too, through. right? You're just poking and hoping and. Yeah. You're hoping you don't knock something off or rip something out. You right. gotta, you gotta, you gotta run wires up by the throttle lever and stuff to get to the dash. And those big plug-ins always want to hang up and sit yeah. on those wire harnesses and stuff. And you yep. get it hung inside there and it's just like you're yanking and trying to get it to pull through there. It's just, it, it. Yeah. It's and mind you, that's an expensive cable too, right? That's not usually <laughs> that cable that you're pulling through there isn't a $60, $70 cable, cable yeah. or, or yeah. more. Yeah. And you screw up the end of it, you're done. It's not like you can go to to the hardware store Walmart. and buy the end and replace it. So yeah. Um B. Kelly said, uh, I think bass boat guys would really like kayak fishing if they tried it from a serious kayak platform. I, I was gonna ask you. Do you feel like you have an advantage in a kayak over a bigger boat at times? A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to brag, but immediately what comes to mind is I fished a tournament at Table Rock early this year, earlier this year. And it was, it was one of those crazy weekends that had like literally, I think like 600 tournament boats on the lake. And I was fishing an area that was near where the BFL was taken off out of. And there was also like, I don't remember, it might have been a Joe Bass tournament, probably like 50 boats. And, you know, I was in an area that I had found fish and I just made up my mind. I knew there was going to be a ton of bass boats, but I just decided I was going to fish the area anyway. And, um, there, I fished around bass boats all day long and I caught fish behind them all day long, literally. And 
you know, I, I feel like a lot of times, like the bass boats, they have this, you know, they just, the, the water displacement, it's just this big mass pushing through the water. And I was catching the fish pretty, sh really shallow, probably more shallower than a lot of the bass boat guys were fishing. And I could fish shallow and be quiet and not disturb the fish. And I feel like if those bass boats are rolling up into those areas, then those fish can sense the boat, the presence of the boat. That's just my theory. I mean, there's other things too. I kind of found a pattern that was working that not many other people were doing, but um, it was just one of those, those cool deals where I was catching a lot of fish behind people. But it just in general, um, I feel like kayakers are forced to fish an area thoroughly and not run around. And so it, it just makes you fish everything and fish slowly and methodically and kind of junk fish. And I, you know, I see it all the time and it's nothing against fast boat guys. They're obviously they're great fishermen. A lot of them are way better than me, but um, I'm just speaking in general terms that, you know, bass boats, I'll, I'll be in a creek all day long and bass boats will run in and, and they'll run by me and they'll be in there for 20, 30 minutes and then they'll run out and another boat will run in and then they'll run out. And I stay in that same creek and I catch a nice limit of fish just staying in that one creek and working it all day. So that for me, I feel like it's improved my skill as a fisherman because it's forced me to just fish the water that's in front of me and work an area thoroughly. And I, I enjoy the fact that I don't have to worry about, should I make a big run around the lake? You know, should I move to another spot or whatever? I just, I don't have that option. So it kind of takes that out of the equation. And, and I, I, I kind of not like not having that dilemma. So. Yeah. I, um, Josh is a kayak fisherman that I run into on Cedar Lake. I ran into him on pyramid and I'm surprised he's not on here. He may be lurking in the background, but very good angler. And last time I spoke with him, I had kind of a tough day and he, he caught him really good shallow he said dirt shallow on a swim jig and that's one thing that the kayak guys have an advantage of over boats with uh you know bigger boats is is being able to get in and he he fishes he has an actual oar he's he's old school paddle but he can slide in on the inside of that grass line you know that there'll be this void of no grass for about five feet and then the grass line will start he'll slide right inside that and fish that inside grass line where somebody that has a trolling motor, it's really hard to do. It's super he's tedious. Super, he's super stealthy going through he's there. Super, he's just sliding along that inside and just making parallel casts and just fishing that he's in that sweet spot that strikes them the whole right. time. Well, they don't see, well, they're, they're, they're looking towards the bank for bluegill that are coming and, out and they're not getting pressure like no, that. They're, they're most they're people fish that outside or they're fishing a frog over the, over the grass. But, you know, and, and if we try to do that, we can do that in, in a bass boat, but you're fishing, you're like 45 in it and you're only actually getting a really small 10, section foot of yeah, on, on, a, on a really lean cast right. where he's able to make, a, you know, a 70 foot cast and milk it and just soak it in that juice the whole time mm -hmm. and then slide down. So there's, I've, I've seen that happen a bunch and there, there's definitely an advantage at times. I mean, like you said, the the curse of well, I don't guess it's a curse. It can be a blessing, but not being able to to, to move around the lake is at, at times if you're if you're in the right area, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna soak it. And you're gonna catch everything that's in the area. Um, there may be situations where it would be an advantage, just advantage. No, it'd be an advantage to be able to move around and cover more water. But man, there's usually if you're in a good lake any cove or any little stretch is going to have fish in it. If you can just you catch slow one, there's down. Gonna be multiple fish there. Yeah. You can just I mean, live scope taught us that or four fish in sonar taught us mm -hmm. that. Now there are, there are dead, some lakes there's dead, there's dead water. True. You know, or True. there's just less fish in that area. There's yeah really good concentrations depending on the time of the year. And there'll be areas that don't have the bass, but yeah, I mean, I, I like that idea of keeping it simple. I, I do that sometimes I, I've gotten, 
to where, um, man, I'll just fish an area, go just stay in one area, not run around, turn the live scope off and just go fishing old school. And you got, I think you got to do that every once in a while to keep your sanity. This it, kinda, it can get too, too technical or too, I don't know. You, you just try to make it too difficult. This kind of brings up my next question here is, you know, the only issue that I've had fishing from the yak was <laughs> wrapping everything up in the rods behind me. Cast. And, and I can see myself doing that yeah. because I, I'm, I'm oblivious to the world when I get out on the lake. So my question to you was, what you know obviously there's a there's a lots of advantages to kayak fishing what what do you miss fishing out of your your glass boat i uh, i mean what i miss the bo- most is probably just being able to to, f- to go with other people in the same boat mm-hmm. i mean i can go out with my kayak buddies and we'll both go to the same lake or something like that but it you know just to be able to go out like with my daughter or you know family members or or my old fishing buddies, you know, I still have a lot of buddies that I used to, to fish bass boat team tournaments with that I just don't, I haven't fished with them in three years since I started kayak fishing. And, um, you know, I, I do miss that, you know, and it can be like you were saying, it's, it's at times like pre-fishing is absolutely critical for kayak fishing because you have to put yourself in an area that has some active fish or else you're going to struggle and, and you can't move. You can, you have to load up and drive somewhere else and it eats up a lot of time. And for me, because my kayak is so big and I got so much junk on it that it takes me longer than some of the simpler kayaks. But, you know, if, if you're in a bass boat, you know, you can run a pattern or you can, you, if you're in a bad area, you just make a move and you go to another part of the lake. So, you know, that, that definitely is something that factors in. You have to, you know, if you just show up in a kayak or fish a tournament and you fish blind in an area, it's kind of a crapshoot. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Stephanie wants to know, do kayaks have spot lock? I think that question was answered by Danny Johnson, but yes, they do. <laughs> yeah, mine does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, like you said, it's uh, if you're in a bass boat and you want to go fish something 10 miles away, you can be there in 10 minutes on just about any lake kayak is is different what's the longest you've ever traveled to fish a section of the lake via by, by, by water via yeah by water yeah so um i i've more than once i've gone about 12 miles round trip in a day so i mean i i you know what basically i figured that by going after the tournament and I just kind of go on Google earth and I map the, the basic route that I fished. And, you know, from the time I left the ramp till the time I got back to the ramp, it was about 12 miles. So, you know, I'd say, you know, five or six miles one way is about as far as I've gone. That's a pretty good distance. My kayak will go close to four miles an hour. There are some, you know, guys that have, they, they have motors called torpedoes that, people will put on the back and they're like electric motors that are more powerful than, than the trolling motor I have on mine because mine's mounted kind of in the front. But, um, and th- those in, so, in a lightweight, fast kayak with a torpedo on the back. I mean, I know a guy that'll go seven miles an hour and obviously he could, he could go further more distance than what I could, but, and some guys pedal, you know, they'll pedal that far or further uh, just manpower, you know, it's unlimited, only limited by your stamina. So uh, in time, but, you know, for me, I usually, when I'm kind of mapping out like an area that I'm going to go look at, I don't, I, I kind of don't figure about going more than five miles and probably on average, it's more like two or three miles from the ramp is kind of the norm for me. So I, I, I wasn't laughing at your four to seven mile an hour. I'm, I'm laughing <laughs> because we deal with the same with, with our boats it's like yeah we're can, like can 20 we, miles an can hour can we get an extra mile an hour out of our our john boat i mean it's it, it, that goes up the line though right whether you're in a kayak and your human power or Minn Kota torquedo. power or torquedo power or john boat with trying to push the envelope the speed and weight and all the same things that you're looking for or if you're in a 21 foot vexus and you're With a 250 you're not trying, a vexus a bass cat a bass cat yeah. and you're, you're running 85 down the lake i mean it all it, it all varies. Um, 
but like my this. my question was what's the you know all, all of the things that are happening with a kayak where where does it stop and now you're on a boat versus a kayak right because that's like you're starting to see we'll call them transom mount motors with that torpedo and getting a little bit more speed you're seeing trolling motors on the boat where, where does where do we draw the line at i mean that's a good question i mean there's already a little bit of a of a uh, a line in the kayak world the probably the biggest national uh, kayak event is the hobie bass open series and that's considered like the high the highest level in competitive kayak fishing but they don't allow motors and they've kind of made that distinction where they feel like they want to stay stay people powered Okay. And um, and then like Bassmaster Kayak Series, they, they will allow motors, but there's you're limited by the uh, limit limitations of your boat. Like they usually have a factory rating. And then I, I think they usually have a like a basic horsepower rating maximum or something like that. And you're only allowed to have one motor and they've made some rules that kind of limit things already. But, you know, like it they're, this they're going to have to to draw the line somewhere you can't because it then it all of a sudden it becomes like a a small boat versus a kayak yeah well, like what who, you who guys say that that john boat that that i have isn't a a kayak now yeah you know, I, I can sit down in my john boat and i can i can paddle if i needed to but i also got you ever try to paddle a john boat it sucks <laughs> it doesn't work i remember well. watching so I can, i'll hard. tell one on you when your trolling motor your pedal went out at Egypt, oh, you remember God. that? Yeah. So we were fishing a a, a a club tournament, and I come around the corner, and this is a bigger lake, and it's cold. It is. That's the morning that there was a, a big really big tournament in a fall. Yeah, the yeah. the, uh, Ellen, the Illini team trail was going out, so there was there was like a hundred boats on yeah. that lake in the fog, and I'm talking fog, like can't see, like can't see, barely see the front of your boat. We're in little 14 foot John yeah. boats, and there's all these big glass boats flying. Well, I, I come around the corner, and he's on a point, and he's up there. Like, there's, there's a skull and paddle laying across the front of the boat. And I see him up there. He's, he sits back down, he makes like four or five casts. And he's, <laughs> I finally went over to him, like, what is going on? He's like, can you batteries? I'm like, no, like, I don't, this was like pre. Any of that stuff that I had in my boat, I just had a foot control trolling motor. Old I had a wireless Minn Kota that had the, it, it was a cool motor, but it had an actual wireless foot pedal yep. that used three of those. I think it was the 2025, you know, bigger calculator battery batteries in there. And they, it went and decided to go out that morning. And what I should have done, but I was still scared to run back. Um, Later on, I could have ran back. I should have ran back to the boat, to the to the yeah. truck, either tied my boat off or put it back on the trailer and went to the dollar store or somewhere. I, I would have been better off to spend an hour off the water yep. trying to find some batteries then than sculling with a paddle where <laughs> I could only get a few casts. Because there was, it was some wind. Oh, yeah. It was day. wind and there were boat wakes going. And ne next thing I know, I was up against the bank and then trying to but, you know, the it was a short sculling paddle, so it's not like I could really push off. I had to right. get like two feet from the bank and push and off. Being and being cold that morning, so gosh, yeah. yeah I still, I still, I, I wait one in that that club. We keep one fish, you know, one keeper. Yeah. So I, I managed to catch a couple keepers that day. Never give up. But yeah. Um. Oh, this is funny. Danny Johnson fishing says, uh, when you've been headed to a spot for twenty minutes and a boat comes sailing past right to the spot you wanted to go man that happens that happens no matter what vehicle you're in you know i tell you what that happens to to us in john boats and that's where we talk about like yeah we all we all run 10 horse john boats you're all in a kayak tournament and if you're in a kayak you got multiple folks that are probably faster than you right Be beating you to a spot for sure uh, but i mean it, that happens at every level whether you're you're running the the elite series or and, and i found out you're gonna go you're almost better off to go right to the juice there's been multiple times where i've tried to expand my my section a little bit and i start like 50 yards down from where i really want to fish yeah. and then somebody comes right in on me and i'm like crap 
You know, I should have yeah. just went right there. There's a meme going around that I saw that's about what Danny's talking about. I mean, we you got to think about like a kayak guy. We might we might be headed to that spot for 20 minutes trying to get there and yeah. just you're like five minutes away and then a bass boat pulls in on it. But I always think about it like most of the time the bass boat's going to fish it for five minutes and then leave. So I just wait and then they're going to, they're going to leave and then I can go fish it after they're gone. So. Yeah, that's true. Just patience. <laughs> to your point though, like I, we've done really well in tournaments doing that same thing. Like somebody stopped here and I know the juice is here. I'm not cutting you off. I'm just going to the juice. Like you stop 400 yards short of it. And I can see that you're going to fish down that way, but I'm going to go right to where I've been catching them at in this 50 yard stretch. And I'm going to continue to fish that 50 yard stretch. So. Andy said the Hobie does allow motors for pre-fishing though. That's that true. Right? I don't, I don't really, I don't really understand that. I mean, if they're not going to allow motors for the tournament, I personally think they shouldn't allow motors in pre-fishing, but I mean, that's, that's their deal. I don't fish the Hobies because I, I have an autopilot and I, I like fishing out of it and I like using my trolling motors. So, and there's so many tournaments to fish that I just, I don't fish those um, just for that reason. Where do they draw the line at? For pre-fishing, can you take a class boat essentially and go pre-fish? Yeah, I. A lot of the tournaments now are actually putting that in the rules that you can't okay. pre-fish out of a bass boat. But I know that has been done uh, in the past. But you know, the the kayak tournament world is still evolving, and they're figuring out. You know, the rules every year. The rules keep get added to a little bit more. This year they went to. A big deal was the big national tournaments went to designated launches. And in the past, you could put in at any public access. And that was creating some gray areas on what people were doing, some stuff that might have been pushing the envelope and of, of what, you know, what the spirit of the rules were and stuff like that. And so they, they keep tightening things down and you mean bass fishermen were trying to find the gray area? Yeah, no. I know. I don't, I don't believe that. it. I don't believe it. <laughs> yep. Uh, Lure Lab says the biggest drawbacks for most people is tipping over, not just getting wet, but losing your gear solutions. Old Town Kayak? Yeah, if you don't want to flip over that autopilot, I, I don't think you could flip it, honestly. I mean, you could if you really, really tried, but you'd have to try really hard. Um but, you know, every, every kayak has advantages and disadvantages, and there's disadvantages to my big, heavy, slow kayak, but it's stable. Um, so if, if that's your thing, if you're worried about flipping over, I definitely look. There's several, different, there's several different brands out there that make big, stable kayaks, so that might be something to look into. Yeah, Dog Days of Fishing says um, when he's fishing, every spare rod, pair of pliers, et cetera, is tethered to the yak. That way, if something does happen, he's going to be able to find his stuff. Yep, phone phone tether is extremely important because without the phone, your tournament is, is done because that's what you use to make your fish. So. Okay, here's Doug has a question. Um, do you start and stop? on your fishing spots or do you have a takeoff and have to be back at a certain time? So that's the part about kayak tournaments that I, I really like. I like it more than the bass boat tournaments. You can, most of the tournaments, I mean, there, there are exceptions. Occasionally you'll do a tournament that'll do like a shotgun start or something like that. But for the most part, the tournaments we fish, uh, they are, um, you can launch from any, uh, public access or a designated access in some tournaments, but they're scattered around the lake. So if, if there's a, if you want to fish way up the river, way up a creek, some hard to access part of the lake where like if you were going to fish it in a bass boat, you might have to run 15 miles through a bunch of standing timber and a treacherous run. And there's a ramp or a spot where you can put in up there then you could just, that's where you can launch from. And so that, I like that part. You're not, 
the, and it, it changes the whole feel of the tournament for me in the bass boat world. The morning takeoff was always kind of like a little bit of a stressful event for me. There's usually long lines at the boat ramp. You're trying to get your boat put in and, and get it, get ready to take off. And, and it was just kind of hectic and man in that, Kayak tournaments, a lot of times I'll pull up to my where I'm going to launch and I might be the only one there or there might be just a few people there and it's real laid back and quiet and I'm like sipping on my coffee and getting my kayak ready and we always launch in the dark. That's kind of, you know, kayak tournaments are notorious for that. The idea is we want to get out there and get to our spot before the bass boat tournaments take off so we don't get run over. And um, so... You know, we're, we're launching a lot of tournaments this time of the year. We launch at 5 a.m., lines in at 5.30, and then we'll fish till, like, uh, lines out will be at, you know, 2.30, 3, depends on the tournament, whatever. And then we'll have a photo submission deadline, and uh, that's when you have to have your pictures uploaded by for, for your fish. So, um, But back to his original point, you can take off most of the time anywhere around the lake, uh, that where where you want to put in at, so everybody gets spread out that way, and you can get to your spot easy. How long do you have after the tournament for your photo submissions? Usually, it's like an hour, hour and a half, something okay. like that, because a lot of times you don't have a good signal on the water, so they no. give you time to get off the water and drive somewhere where you have a signal, so you can get your fish uploaded. I mean, ideally, if the the signal is good where you're at. You can upload your fish throughout the day and everybody can actually see in real time how you're doing. But a lot of times these areas don't have good cell phone reception. And so you have to just wait till you get off the water. And part of the pre-tournament planning, actually, you if you know you're going to be in an area that doesn't have a good signal, you have to kind of plan where you're going to get to that has a signal so you can get your, your fish uploaded in time. Nobody sandbags though, do they? They don't. Wait oh, absolutely, <laughs> they do. <laughs> and it's always like if you're leading, when the well, a lot of times they shut the leaderboard off maybe an hour or two before the end of the tournament to kind of build suspense. But you can't count on if you're leading the tournament, even if it lines out, because there'll be a whole wave of people that submit their fish late. So. You yeah. know you're you know you're gonna drop some spots once people start submitting their fish. That's part of it. It always happens. Yeah, you're probably better off just to not even look at your phone for a couple hours because it'll just it'll let you down. I, I've that's happened. You you've been like that before. You go in on you're halfway through a way in, you're sitting in third place, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna get a top ten. I mean, you, you do the math. You're like, okay, even if uh, there's 40 more boats left, uh, maybe I'll get a top ten. Next thing you know, you're in 23rd. You're like, ah, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, all the people with big bags like to wait to the end, make it dramatic. Oh yeah, yeah, they're really good at doing that. Darius, um, he says if he sees a kayak, he gives he gives them um, the water because he can find another place to fish. I do that too. You know, I kind of look at it as I do the same thing with bank fishermen. There's somebody on the bank. I mean, they're limited to that little stretch of the bank. Kayak is they, they're mobile, but they're slow mobile. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm really courteous to kayak fishermen and bank fishermen. What do you, what do you see out there in the water? Do you find that most other boats are respectful of kayaks or do you have to battle with that each time? Do you, do you have a, I mean, I don't Probably know. It's, I feel like my experience is different from what I hear from other people. And I don't really know why, because I hear stories from guys pretty regularly about getting cut off and having bad interactions with boaters and stuff. But I don't have, I don't really have too much problem. And part of it, I, I kind of wonder, and this is just some theory that I have, but I stand up and fish all day and I, I wonder if, like, the fact that I, I mean, maybe I, I look a little bit uh, more, I don't know, more like them. I don't know. But they they almost always respect my water. I don't get cut off much. And and guys are always friendly to me. So um, I, don't, I don't know why I don't have too much trouble. And I hear other guys that do. But sometimes, uh, you know, at the end of the tournament, guys will be talking about it and, 
and I hear that happens, but I haven't had too much trouble. I mean, it's happened a few times, but it happened to me in the bass boat too. I yeah. think it happens to everybody to a certain extent, but. I think the more you're on the water, you have more tolerance for stuff, things that I, I know I'm speaking for myself personally, things that may have bothered me in the past don't seem to bother me anymore. I mean, I can make, I can make a Guggen video several times a year where somebody does something stupid out in the water, cuts me off. But my perspective is not the same as it was 10 years ago. It doesn't bother me as much. It's, it's kind of gotten to the point where, A, it doesn't happen all that, all that often, but B, my mindset is I'm out here to enjoy this time on the water. I have a limited amount of time to do this. If I let this small thing that, you know, took 10 seconds, if I let this 10 second segment of my day affect the next four hours, then I'm really not doing the best with my mind or my time. So I've gotten to where you, you just kind of, I mean, if you need to justify it or if you need to kind of poke fun at that person, and a lot of times internally, I'll just say, what an idiot, what a freaking idiot, you know, or they're just out They're They only fish a couple times a year. They don't really know that they're doing what they're doing. Um, or, or I say something internally that makes me feel better about the situation. But um, I do think perspective. I think there's some perspective. What do you think? You just shoot all you're, of them. You're a better man than me. No, I mean, really. <laughs> you, you know? you, I, I know, have least, you ever had words with somebody? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. Have, I've had words with – I've had a couple altercations with them. I've had, I've had a couple. I've had one, uh, the video I did a couple years ago where we were fishing that, that first island in Egypt. And this guy, we're casting. We'd been on this, fishing this saddle for an hour. And here comes this older guy. And he's just going right up the tip of the point. And we're casting. And he goes, I mean, we easily could cast in his boat. No problem. Right. He goes right where we were catching fish and starts fishing. And that was one of those where it was so blatantly obvious that the guy could care less. And the guy that was in the back of the boat wouldn't even look at us. He actually turned around. Did he do one? <laughs> he did. He turned around and put his <laughs> rod down. He put his rod down and he just sat like this with, with his back to us. And the old older guy was just fishing away. And we had words with him. Yeah. You know, we had words with him. That, that was like too far over the right. line. There's right. sometimes you do have to speak up, but you had, well, so you've had words with people last fall, last fall. So I was, it's a, it's a you know, no secret. It's frog frog season, and there's certain stretches of, of banks that are really really good. And I stopped on the juice, like which we just talked about. Like I, I knew I was headed to that spot, and I, I set up, and I'm I'm on the point. Like you can see me from north, south, east, west. I am on the freaking point. And boat runs by, spins around, and comes in and fishes the point. Like. We're nose to nose fishing this point out. Like you just crossed the line for me. Like mm -hmm. I can, we, we're, you're casting within 10 to 15 feet of my boat across this point. And I'm just, yeah. You never said a word to me. I'm just, I'm giving him the, the business and he's just got his head down fishing. And then I catch like a four pounder right in front of him and I throw it in the box. And I'm like, give him the salute. I, I've had guys, off. I've had guys and I, and I'm, I did a little video on this. When it's really extreme, maybe I will just do a video because it's more like a PSA just to yeah, let stop. people don't be that person. I, I've, I've been on the bank like 30 feet off the bank casting to the grass line and somebody go right in between me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it really happened. Two guys just drifting right in between me. Didn't even say hi to me. Didn't say anything. Yeah. Just go. It's like a little, it's like you're fishing in a, in a little, like a couple little ducks swims in front of you yeah. that's what they, but it was a boat yeah i'm just like so, I, I don't even know what to say for me it depends on the day too like there's some days that i'm out there i just start laughing like i'll laugh i'll laugh out loud at you for being disrespectful idiot unbeknownst like do you not know the etiquette and the courtesy to not do that i mean i would imagine like human nature says if i'm sitting in walmart and i'm looking at the 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 great Kool-Aid don't walk in front of me and pick up or start looking at the, the Kool-Aid selection. 
Like if you got to pick up, if you're yeah. in a hurry and you want to pick up cherry, like, hey, excuse me, but I'm going to grab this real yeah, quick. Don't get in front of my Cheetos. Yeah, yeah don't don't cut me off. Aisle nine might get lit up really. That's quick. right. That's yeah. right. But then there's other days I'm just going to like, you're an idiot. Go on. Go on about your day. Have fun. And let's move on. So. Yeah, I, I think probably as much tension for kayakers happens at the boat ramp. Uh, from what I've heard, like there's a lot of yeah. kind of interactions between kayakers and boaters. You know, there, there's a perception by some people that kayakers shouldn't be using a boat ramp. And but there's also some kayakers who don't don't have their their game plan together to get get in and get off the boat ramp and out of the way quickly. You I said mean, that I, really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like that. <laughs> but yes. uh, I mean, I'm I can literally launch mine. I, I load everything in the kayak. Mine's on a trailer, and I have it completely ready to go. And then I back down the ramp, and it slides right off the the trailer into the water, just like a bass boat. I have a rope tied to the front, pull it up to the side. And I'm, I mean, I'm in and out of there quicker than a bass boat a lot of times, but, um, you know, and I, some guys don't have trailers. They, and you know, some guys use carts and they, but it's difficult to wheel everything down there to launch. And, and I get it, but if you're going to be a kayaker, you got to have a, a strategy and a, a plan to be able to, to not tie up the boat ramp, but at the same time, you know, people, other people like with boats have to realize that, you know, we, we all have the, the right to use those facilities as well. Just we have to be respectful of each other. So, I mean, I think if everybody would just, you know, respect each other, everything would be great. But that doesn't always happen. A bad kayaker is just as bad as a bad guy backing down the damn <laughs> boat ramp sideways. I mean, the guy that, or, park, the or, guy that parks crooked on the ramp yeah. and... And, and he's crooked on the ramp. Same way, doesn't have. A, I love this. A game plan when you're ready. I mean, I would say you didn't have your shit together, but he didn't have a game plan. <laughs> and uh, he's unhooking the boat. He's putting the rods in the boat. He's yeah, putting the plug in the boat because he already backed in. He's doing forgot. parking lot stuff. Yeah, on, like, on the boat ramp. That's what you should do in the staging area, right? That a lot of these lakes have a, a staging area. That's where you pull up and you get all your your stuff together. You're prepared. You got your game plan. You back up. And, and same way, like, if you're prepared with a kayak, you have a trailer on yours. But some guys, like you said, don't have a trailer. You back down the ramp. You, you knock it in the water. You pull up, and you walk back down there. You tie it off to the dock, whatever. We do the same thing with our boat. But you when, when a, either the kayaks are parked crossways, and there's three of them all sitting out there, and there's nobody around, and they're all up in the parking lot, John, is no different than three guys back down the ramp with their boats parked on the ramp. John. Well, I've seen the situation I've seen happen a couple times and, and, I, and a lot, most kayakers that I've ran into are very uh, courteous. They've got a game plan. They're, they're good. They'll either, if they're not able to launch their boat, they'll pull up next to the boat ramp and they'll walk it down to the bank, yep. an area that they can slide off. In. Or they're nervous. Oh. Now, a lot of them are nervous now because they want to get out of your way. They feel like they're in the right. way all the time. Right. But I've seen somebody back up. This has happened a couple times where they backed up. This is a um, the local lake is a two lane boat ramp. It's a small two lane boat ramp. It's really, it's really tight. And they'll back up in, in one lane and put all their stuff in the other lane and get everything ready. And it, and it typically doesn't take, I've seen it take 10, 10 or 15 minutes before yeah. I really have, but a lot of times it doesn't take that long, but that's pretty rare. I mean, most, most folks are in and out at about the same time it would take us to launch our John boats. And, and that's understandable. I think, I think that um, the whole deal is to get everything ready in the yeah, parking the, the lot. The PSA is get your, get your yeah. stuff ready before you. I, I've seen go people. Down. I've seen people. This drives me absolutely nuts. In a John boat, they'll pull up. They'll, they'll back the trailer in, put their boat on the trailer, and and then they'll take them. Um, it, it can take five minutes for them to get it up up on the trailer. I right. don't know. I don't know how it takes that long, but some people it takes that long for whatever reason. And then they'll pull up, and they'll they'll get over the crest of the boat ramp and stop right there. They're not on the boat ramp, but they're where you need to, to turn to straighten out, to come down. And they're just like, you might as well be all the way across the boat ramp. Cause I can't yeah. do anything. And then they'll, they'll crank, you know, they'll ratchet their, they'll ratchet everything tight. They'll ratchet the back strap the straps. They'll put their motor toat on there. They'll, and then they got to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. 
they do all the stuff and Ugh. it's just and a lot of times that happens after i've already tied on all my i've already re-rigged everything that can be re-rigging time if it if you get to the lake and that's going on it's like no big deal because you're already going to be in the parking lot re-rigging for 10 15 minutes with me having a YouTube channel, it takes me 10 minutes to get all my GoPro footage. Yeah, uh, but you go GoPro park stuff. somewhere. Like, yeah, yeah, I don't do it right there. I'm off in the parking lot. But I ideally, that would be going on while I'm doing this other stuff. But m most of the time, it's after I've already spent 30 minutes re-rigging, getting all my GoPro stuff ready. Then I pull up, and then this here happens. comes that person backing in, and I got to wait another 10 minutes. But, yeah. You know, first world problems. But, well, yeah, be know, courteous, yeah. get your stuff ready you before know, you launch your boat. And if we're going to – this is our – last part of my rant chad may have a little bit more but <laughs> if, if we're gonna go on, off on a rant like learn how to freaking park your damn boat and truck and trailer and everything in a parking lot just because there's an open parking spot five down doesn't mean you need to park there or because it's closer park in a line if the guy pulled in here pull in right next to him and then the next guy and the next guy and the next guy and the next guy and then we don't have this giant car and a half gap that's crooked that nobody can park into yeah, so, especially on a lake with a limited 20, enough room for 20 rigs. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah it's just you know, real estate straight. is essential. What's up, Jermaine? Good to see you on your mainstream fishing. Um, guys, go check out his channel sometime. He's doing some pretty good stuff. Um, Let's talk about some baits. Yeah, yeah. We got something cooking outside of the our yeah. view right now. I can, I, can, I can sense it. What is it, Chad? Well, so... I mean, I just want to start off and talk a little bit about um, like Crocky Gator partners up with H2 Bait Design and it's a partnership H2 Bait Design Manufacturing, Jason Husky. He he pours a lot of the soft plastics uh, that Crocky Gator sells and he's also involved in the design. He's extremely good at uh, cab design he does actual like the draft the the draft documents you know that have all of the dimensions he puts that into his computer software he's got the cnc machine to cut the molds he's he's a really good fisherman so he's kind of got like the total package there and it's a great partnership with crocagator and and i've been able to work with them this year uh with with jason to create some baits and and it's not just me. There's there's other people involved too. But there's there's one bait in particular that I've been working on with uh, Jason since uh, this winter. We've probably been six or eight months now. We've been working on this bait, and we we really wanted to come up with a versatile bait that can be used as a jig trailer. That's something that we desperately needed for Crocky Gator with all their jigs and everything, and. You know, we got like the ring crop, but we needed like a, a summertime uh, jig trailer. And so we came up with this bait. Jason started off with it and uh, he had a basic uh, prototype, but I did, I wasn't happy with the legs on it. I wanted the legs to kick, you know, like if you put this thing on a three eighths ounce jig and it's falling through the water under its own weight. I wanted those legs to, to swim behind it. And that was kind of one of the things I was looking for, but Joey really wanted me to emphasize. And it's really important to her that Crocky Gator, we come up with our own baits and, you know, that's kind of a thing now where like some bait companies are just reproducing baits that are already out there. We put a lot of thought, and uh, design and testing into these baits. And we're trying to come up with baits that are unique. And uh, we've, we've got, you know, we all have our favorite baits. Uh, we have baits that, that we've got a lot of confidence in. And I definitely had some baits that I was looking for characteristics of those baits to try and incorporate those into this bait. And so there's probably some similarities, but, um, but these, this is the, it's got the unique crocagator flair to it. And uh, so, without further ado, okay. And Hold we don't on. Even... Let me put you. Let me put you on solo here. Let me get this. There we go. Yeah. That's so nice. I like that. We don't even have a name for it yet, uh, but we're just calling it. I've been calling it the Gator Craw. But um, so this is a bait that the the legs come. They're attached like uh, to each other uh, for, out of the mold. And that's the way it'll come. You can tear them apart. And when you tear them apart, they're, they're going to kick with a swimming action. 
But if you leave it together, then you've got more of like a beaver style where it's going to have uh, not have the action. Uh, so, you know, if you had cold water, or you're wanting more of a subtle presentation, then, you know, you might want to leave them together. But I usually this time of the year, I'm pulling them apart. And uh, so some of the some of the things that make this unique, we've got these little tentacles on here and they're uh, kind of, you know, the same tentacles that we have on the swamp bug and the beaver mm -hmm. bug. So, uh, you know, that kind of kept that same theme. It's got ribs on it, which are great because when you like if you're Texas rigging this, you can tuck that hook point right up inside those ribs. Um, you can rig this bait a lot of different ways. Um, Texas rig, of course, but um, I've got it rigged. So this is rigged here on the zapper jig. And a lot of times what I do is I take and you can just pinch those little tentacles off if you don't want them on there and i do that like when i'm using a a, a bait that um has a skirt i'll just i just take those tentacles off of there and uh then you know you can also use it this is the uh crocagator pro line swim jig which is pretty new bait for them i mean they redesigned the swim jig and came out with this not too long ago and this is one i actually just cut off my rod uh in sunfish and it I've caught a ton of fish just uh I can see you've been scrubbing the bottom with that thing it looks like yeah so um you know that's another way to rig it have you rigged yeah. it sideways on a swim jig I have not but you certainly could I mean I have it another this is a chatter bait and I got it oh, rigged yeah. on there and that's a that's definitely a bait that you might take and turn that sideways and rig it on there uh, I know that you know that's pretty common to do with other trailers on your uh, chatterbait and then i have it rigged here this is the instigator uh, swing head jig and this is the hook actually the hook that comes with the with that when you buy it and it rigs up perfectly on there and that, that's a probably one of my favorite ways to fish this bait but um how long has that instigator been out the swing head oh uh, as long as as long as i've been with really? crocky gator uh, okay. I, it's it's been out for a while and uh and you know this it's a pretty cool uh design it's got that uh quick change clevis on there oh yeah that you can just snap the hook on and off so you can change hooks really easily which if you're you know if you fish to swing head much you're either if you change baits and uh you know, you need to change the hook size or sometimes the hook just gets dull or whatever and you need to switch it out. Um, it's, it's great to do that. So, um, you know, those are, um, this is another one that I have. Me and Jason have been playing around with colors. This one is uh, got the, the blue. And, yeah, an uh, oak Joby crawl. Yeah, and this is like one that I had to make for me. Um, if you're familiar with like net bait, they got a color called... Uh, I think it's Kentucky special where you put green pumpkin on one side and then like it's like plum on the other yeah and that's like a that. that's a favorite color for me as well so um you know the other thing about the baits that Jason's making for crocagators this goes all the way the DC worm the COG worms like the shorty and and all of those baits and uh you know these baits and the other, the other bait I'm going to show you and all of those baits are made with a, a different kind of plastic that is unique. The most, yeah, I haven't ever seen it in any other baits and it's, it's a floating plastic, but it's not like, you know, if you're familiar with like elastic or Z-Man baits, those are floating baits. They have a lot of buoyancy and, but they have that, they're that stretchy material and it's like really hard to, you can't rig it on a screw lock or anything like that. I mean, this is like, regular plastic but it's it floats and literally like if you have a fish like bite your bait and then it comes off the hook you look out in the water and this thing is just like floating out there on the surface of the water mm -hmm. it, it literally floats and I've, I've got some videos that i did earlier this year of those cog worms and stuff i mean they stick straight up in the in the like the tank video that i did and i mean the the floating plastic's really cool and I mean, there's 
There might be other companies that use it, but I haven't really seen them out there. So that, that's um, a big real quick before we go any further. That's a that's a big misconception with, say, a shaky head. You think that just because you got a stand up head that your bait's actually standing up on the bottom. And that's not true because a lot of these soft plastics are loaded with salt and salt has a lot of weight. It's not buoyant and it's going to your bait's just going to lay on its side, which is fine. It, it, it will work. Um, at certain times, but something like the plastic that's in these Crockett Gator baits that floats is going to really stand up. Even with a ball head, it's going to stand up. You don't just have to have an actual stand up shaky head, but you know that it's going to be doing it. And the same thing with a jig. It's going to, when you pop it up, it's going to, a lot of times it's a slow kind of this deal, you know, it's defense, gonna, right? Defense. It's a slow, it's a, it's like, it's a secondary action is what, what we call it. So you've got your main action of the bait. And then when it's sitting, it's doing something else. And that's caused by a high floating plastic and man, it's, it's really deadly. And then, and then if you, something like a uh, Carolina rig, if you're fishing uh, something that's floating the Carolina rig, you, you fish a really light, thin wire hook, a two-aught or a three-aught hook on light line, and something that's a floating plastic is going to actually hover a lot more than something that has a lot of salt in it. So there's a lot of advantage on, advantages of having a plastic that's a high-flow plastic. Yeah, so anyway, that that's uh, that's our, uh, our new craw, and, uh, you know, we spent... I think we went through like eight eight revisions. Um, we at one point we completely scrapped the legs all together and started over because we just weren't getting the action we wanted. But this thing looks incredible in the water. It's got a great swim in action, and uh, you know these little tentacles give it extra movement in the water. Or you know if you don't want them, you just pinch them off. It's really easy to do, and uh, so it's kind of flat, right? Is it flat? Side like turn it side, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, there you go. You get yeah. hunch bait, yeah, hunch bait. Yeah. Yeah, have a little and actually, up. that's part of the reason. Uh, Jason, uh, he he put those uh, these little tentacles on the side there at an angle, and that's specifically did that so that it'll go through cover better. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's just another one of the things. It's got these little I don't know if you can see them, they come on to stick together a little bit, but there's these little little yeah. bulbs. Yeah. On the end of the antennas there. Joey calls them the balls. Right. I, <laughs> that's that's what you were thinking. I can thing. tell when you're giggling exactly what you're thinking. That's a male bait, yes. Yeah. So, you know, that a lot of little details there. Um, and pretty, pretty proud of that. I think it's gonna be a great bait. We've had we've had pro staff using it. Uh Jim Schnabel. Oh yeah. Um, I sure. heard he absolutely raked them in a tournament on this and you know, couldn't tell anybody about it, but I've, I've caught a lot of fish on it. It's, that's one of the hardest things about working on these baits. Uh, I've been, you know, doing the, like, we've got a lot of new baits that were, are in the works. We've got swim baits and uh, some cool, if you're familiar with the hover rig, there's a deal that Jason's working on. I shouldn't say anything more than that, but I I've, mean, some, some cutting edge, I've cutting seen, edge stuff. Yeah, I've seen that, some of the pictures too. I can't talk about it, but yeah. And it's like, you, you're using these baits and I, I try to post on social media a lot, but I can't post any, any <laughs> pictures like fish catches or anything. Cause I'm catching them on baits. I can't talk about, but, um, yeah. so I, I want to talk about the other bait, uh, that it's, you're going to see some similarities, but, um, this is our hog style bait. Um, yeah, and our uh, still not names are terrible. Joey hates doing names. I hate doing names. Uh, we haven't got names yet, but I'm calling this the Gator Hog, and uh, you know it's got these same tentacles on it. It's got the ribs, just like a. If you look at the body, it's very similar to uh, this the Swamp Bug. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know there this is a actually a really versatile bait. Also, um, you know obviously. You know, you got the creature bait hog thing going there. But what I've been doing with this, I mean, you can like pinch those little tentacles off and then it gives a different profile, a little less bulk and action there. And then you can actually take these little flappers and just pinch them off. And I've been using it like this. That's nice. Just yeah. a worm. And for me as a kayak fisherman, both of these baits, um, 
they just give you a lot of versatility. You know, I can't carry a lot of stuff in my kayak. And even though I have a big kayak and I carry more than most. Um, I got confidence in that right there, right now, yeah. without you throwing it. That, yeah. that little, that stripped down version like that. Yeah, like a yeah. little, like a fat, you know, fat <laughs> twin tail worm thing. Yeah, I that can tell good. you, I've already been catching fish on it. It's oh. it's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. And I mean, you could put that on a shaky head or... Heck yeah. Um, or Texas yeah, you, rig. Yeah, or, you can do a lot of stuff with that. A lot of stuff. Um, but, you know, they I could carry these two baits and, you know, I can do so many different things with just those two baits. So, um, you know, we're, we're excited. We're expecting Jason. I know he's got the molds. Like he, when, when we do these, he just makes a basic, like a uh, small cavity mold for this when we're testing them. And he pours them for us to to test and stuff. But then when when we actually start production of these, he's got to do a big elaborate production mold with a lot of cavities and stuff. And I know he's got those molds pretty close to ready to go on the hog. He's still working on them for the craw. And you know that he's and actually you don't realize how much goes in. Like there's these little flanges on the the tip here of these of the of the of the legs oh and yeah right it i'm terrible at getting this to line up on camera but um you know he it, it takes a lot of uh it, it's not always easy to get the molds cut so that everything fills out the mm -hmm. way they're supposed to and so he's still working out like how the hair is going to vent out of them, of them and everything so that all those little details fill out the way they're supposed to but he he's working on that mold and we're expecting uh, September ish time frame that these baits are going to be available. And if you're lucky enough to win the, the uh, giveaway tonight, then you're going to get them sooner. But um, nice. I'm jealous. See, yeah. I, don't, I don't even have any. So whoever wins the giveaway is going to have them before I'll even have my and hands that's like, on. Well, you, but so the launch of the, some of those baits is like perfect. Perfect timing. timing. Right? They're, those are really good fall baits too. That's going to be fall city. Yes. Well, and you yeah, said you can pinch the tail off and make a, 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 a net bait out of it too. Yeah. So this craw, like I said, like I would even throw it in the winter time and just leave the the legs together. And yeah, you know, right. like people put a beaver on a jig all the time or something with no action, and it's just um, that I I feel like this is a a trailer that you could throw on a jig year round um or you know a shaky head or you know in the in the cold water these little tentacles have a lot of movement so i mean this this bait's gonna play year round see that's um, and, that's the jig trailer that i've always wanted i wanted a, a ballsy jig trailer yeah well i know the <laughs> a ballsy jig trailer i got that yeah <laughs> it's definitely ballsy i mean obviously it's right there in your face yeah. you can see him he's got a good set <laughs> of balls on him there's no denying <laughs> hanging, it hanging low that's right. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Um, that beaver bug is a really good cold water bait. And that's sort of got a little bit of the profile. It's a little bit different tail, but it's got the little tentacles on it. It's kind of flatter. And yeah. Um, so it's the same kind of floating plastic in all the baits. Uh, Stillwater fishing was one wanting to know. Uh, that's correct. So, I mean, like, for example, the tube, that's a different deal. Uh, Jason mm -hmm. doesn't make the tubes, but... Um, the COG worms, the shorty, the DC worm, uh, the the uh, X toad uh, that came out earlier this year. Um, these baits that I just showed you, those all use that floating plastic. And he's actually going to start. He didn't previously make the swamp bug and the beaver bug and the ring craw. But he is going to start making those as well and producing oh, cool. those for crack to gators. So those will be also be made out of that same floating plastic. And you may get a little bit even better action out of those baits now with that buoyant plastic. So that's a pretty cool thing, too. Uh, he did tell me today that they did a run of the green pumpkin purple of the like the swamp bug and beaver bug recently and they kind of promoted that that particular color in several baits and the shorty i think and so 
the the green pumpkin purple ones are the new plastic i think some of the other colors might still be previous stock because they're kind of making that transition but that's my favorite color i think green pumpkin purple that's a good color for I sure color. you know what these space should be called right what what do you think i don't know sasquatch crawl yeah <laughs> sasquatch crawl the, the squatch crawler the, the ballsy squatch that like, that, it, that looks kind of squatchy there it is kind of yeah. squatchy. I mean, it's got the like really rough hair look into it. It's got a big profile. Um, man, I like that. I think that's going to do really good. I really do. Um, it just seems when you start pinching things off, it I like makes the it just multi. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It makes it multi versatile. That, that takes even you know John boat anglers. You know, we have, we struggle with the same thing, uh, just not overloading the boat. Because I mean, we we both talk about this at the you know midway through the season when we're both fully into fishing you open up a compartment and it's like oh crap i've got way too much crap in here no wonder i've lost four mile an hour in my boat this this summer it's not because it's hot outside it's because of, i've exhausted every soft plastic and i've stuck it some in some crevice in the boat so you're looking for the magic bait that's right yeah that's right i got magic it. bait you got it so what do you got going on? Uh, you, you mentioned you're you're going out of town tomorrow. What's yeah, uh, another tournament the, or hitting the road tomorrow for the All American Kayak Series? It's going nice. to be up at uh, well, it's based out of Minasqua, Wisconsin, which it's northern Wisconsin. Anybody who knows that area is like Boulder Junction up there. It's kind of a it's, it's a fishing paradise up there. There's like thousands of lakes and we're fishing a tournament that's a, called a road runner. It's got a 50 mile radius centered around Minasqua, Wisconsin. And so there's, I don't know, hundreds of lakes that are within the area we can fish. And uh, so you pick a lake and, um, you know, of course they got musky and pike and walleye and panfish and all that stuff, but there's huge smallmouth, uh, great, large mouth bass fishing but kind of like i think pretty much the expectation is that smallmouth are going to be the key to winning this tournament it's not uncommon to catch five six even seven pound smallmouth up there so that's kind of what i'm going to be looking for i'm i've never been up there so i gotta hope that i can pick a good lake you know but um it's going to be fun no matter what be up there for I'm leaving tomorrow, pre-fish Thursday, and the tournament runs Friday and Saturday. So it'll be a should be a fun trip. The fishing's so phenomenal up north. It's just amazing. The weather. Hopefully, the well. I don't know. It gets hot up there too, but well, I know the fishing will be good. There, it they're like lows in the fifties and highs in the upper seventies, eighty-ish oh, is what it's oh, predicted to be up there. That's just that's gonna terrible. be heaven. So yeah, cool. we're I'm camping out up there with a buddy, and it's nice. I'm looking forward to it. And I need that trip. I need that trip. I've been really. I think we talked about this last week. Um, I used to go to Montauk trout fishing all the time. I go once every month or, or once every two months or something, and I haven't been in two years. But I, I need that. I need to go out in that cool water and you, stand out there in the stream with my fly rod and i mean i still fly fish in the back in the pond back here but there's something different about being in a river with the fly rod versus you know pond fishing with the fly rod it's totally different it was definitely uh even just the floating the the black river this weekend was it kind of got me peaceful you know and and nothing against montauk because i love current river it's, it's it was my second home in college right mm -hmm. I, I spent a lot of nights at on the riverbank up there um but black was was less crowded less people you would love the 11 point have you been to 11 I haven't point? Been 11, point. 11 points even less than that really it's so beautiful and yeah. it's got good fish too it's got small mouth large mouth um yeah that's the thing i'm the thing i don't miss about montauk is how it's overcrowded now it's you so used to be able to go down there tourist. 20 years ago you could just drive down on friday you could get a not a basic campsite and not have to worry about it but now you have to book like six months in advance to you know to get a place so you're camping out you're just uh 
you actually tank camping or do you got a pop-up camper or something? So since I, it's weird when I, I never used to camp when I was fishing tournaments in my bass boat, but it's kind of a whole different culture in the kayak world. It seems like a lot of people camp and I, I got started doing that. I bought a Toyota Tundra a couple of years ago and uh, the back seat flips up and I built a little platform uh, behind the front seats and uh, I'm, I'm short, you know, I'm five foot six, 140 pounds. So I can almost completely stretch out back there. I've, I've got a little mattress and a sleeping bag and I sleep in my truck and I've done it a bunch of times now. And I've, I, I sleep great in my truck and uh, it's super easy, you know, and it's way better than a hotel or something like that. Um, you know, of course you, I usually get a campground. It's got showers and stuff in a bathroom nearby. And, um, I love it. I mean, only bad time is like, I wouldn't want to camp now here in Missouri with the heat, but yeah, um, most of the time though, even last month I camped at Truman and it wasn't too bad. And, uh, so that makes it easy. And when you get up in the morning, you know, you just basically, uh, get up and I take some, uh, iced coffee and get some coffee and kayak and everything's ready to go and you just roll out. So, yeah, there is something you feel more in tune with nature too when you're out and i used to do that a lot i had a had an eight foot bed in my truck with a camper shell on it and i'd blow i'd have a queen size air mat mattress it fit right in between the the wheel wells perfectly and i'd do that a lot it was it was awesome man i had um you know i had it rigged up to where i could i could uh put my rods up on the top of the camper shell just to get them out of the way. Cause that's, that's something that you kind of have to deal with is your clothes and your shoes and yep. stuff in the actual tent with you or in the, in the bed of the truck with you. So there's a yep. little bit of figuring that out. I, I had a buddy who had a van. He had a, uh, Tom, Tom, winter, winter Thank chicken goodness. dinner. Finally, he's I been knew, scrolling through. You, you got cross-eyed like three times. I, I, think. I, <laughs> I knew he was going to win like, 10 numbers ago because he was skip. He was on the odd numbers and he was skipping every other one. And I'm he's like, doing, yeah, he's, he's got the this. Right thing. He's he's got this. So we got a winner, Tom, get a hold of Gabe. Yeah. Um, send me, send me your shipping information, Tom, and I'll get it over to Joey and she's going to take care of it. You're going to be getting some pretty sweet stuff. You're going to get the stuff that Chad showed a while ago, which is not out in the market yet. And I'm sure Joey's going to put you together. Some of the yeah. pride and true stuff too. I told her to, or she she told me to pick out some of my favorite stuff to throw in there. I'm nice. I'm probably gonna tell her some uh, some X bite buzz baits. That's like one of my favorites. Some tubes, maybe some zapper jigs, that kind of stuff. Um, Pack of toads, maybe. Some X toads, definitely to go with that X bite buzz bait for sure. I love it too because Tom's like faithful, right? Oh, yeah. Tom, Tom doesn't miss. Tom's an He's OG. Always, He's always, always on here. here. Always it's here. good to see it. Congrats but again. My buddy had a van back to that camping situation. He down had, by the river? He had a Tom. Down by the river? Yeah. <laughs> Literally like down by the river? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he would, let's see, it was like, I, I don't know what it was. It was one of those conversion vans. It was a bigger van. Like an econo van. line? Yeah, like an econo line or something. But he had built a plywood bed that was elevated, maybe. 18 inches so he had a mattress across that and you could slide all kinds of stuff underneath it mm -hmm. he had the full length of the band band for storage underneath so it was so sweet and then he had actually put um he had put some paneling on the sides to where he had hooks and different things in there so you could hang your fly vest up on the inside and you put your you put your rods on the top and all your clothes and stuff was underneath. I mean, it was like a travel ready to go fishing. Machine. It was a fish, it was like bum. the mystery machine for fishing. Fish was, bum rig. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was super sweet. I love that little van. I, nice. I tell you what, we we did that at Gunnersville. You talk about camping. We we decided to go. That was the the year that you made Gunnersville. I didn't make Gunnersville. And the year that I made not Gunnersville, Chickamauga. Oh, Chick. Uh, mm -hmm. We both missed a regional there, in opposite years, but. We the last time I was down there, we camped and tent camp, not not anything fancy. And that was probably the, one of my most memorable trips in the last five or six years. Cause that was just you, you be, like you said, you become one with nature. Uh now we had frost on the tent one morning when we woke up. That was 
that wasn't the, the most pleasurable experience. It gets cold but, in those tents, man. But I tell you Ooh. what, the the fact that like we ate probably the best food that I've ever had over the campfire on a cast iron skillet and I mean we had good good chefs in camp and you know was, why? Because it's not fast food. Yeah. You know, something about camping around a fire. You don't care if it takes an hour and a half to get your steaks no. or your potatoes or your pork and beans. And when it, there's something about time and the quality of the food. Patience yeah, you, you can take it. You can take some pork and beans, throw them in the bowl, and put them in the microwave, and be done with it in three and a half minutes. Yeah. And but then, that same can, an hour over the campfire. Yeah, it's special. Yeah. It's totally different. Yeah. Yep. You know, it was the uh, the only meal that we ate out all week was breakfast, and we ate out breakfast every every meal and but it was one of those like greasy spoons where you could get your breakfast for like six bucks and it was more food than you wanted to stomach that early in the morning uh but we stopped there every single morning and it was kind of like the place you talk about down at um like the ozarks like the ozarks yeah the by the house. by the second morning she knew exactly what we wanted she's like same thing as yesterday like i've been in here one time in my life same thing as yesterday yes ma'am okay i'll have it right up and here she comes out with Plates of food. Yeah, she's like two eggs over easy, yeah. wheat toast, uh, gravy on the side, yep. and you want chocolate chip pancakes and a water and a milk. Yep, yep, two percent milk. That was exactly right. Yeah, yeah. It's, they'll, I love those waitresses with, with like three or four guys sitting at the table. Yeah, it's so, amazing. Yeah, I it is amazing. It. Yeah. Um. Oh, Tom says uh, he's been driving. Is that is that Tom Incognito? No, I know. You can rate them for fishing. yeah, exactly. Andy said Chad Hoover's got a pretty sweet setup too. Yeah, he used to have like one of those tents on the top of his. I think it was on the top of his kayak trailer, but you see that a lot. Kayak guys will have this like one of those fold up tents that's like mounted on the top of the trailer, and you climb a little ladder and get up in it, and it just pops up into a tent. I mean, you see them on top of trucks too, but. Um, that's a pretty cool deal. I guess with the trailer, I mean, that's that's a heck of an idea because you're already hauling the trailer. You have you have gear on the trailer, but it's not to the extent of, you know, a bass boat back there where you can't really pitch a tent on a bass boat. I guess you yeah. could, but you got a perfect platform on top just to, to do something like that. I never mm -hmm. even thought about something like that. So um, I want to ask you a couple more questions before we wrap this up. Yep. First of all, uh, I, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'm ask a question and go to the bathroom. But best rods for kayak fishing because, you know, it's not like, I mean, I don't know, but I would think that, you know, you're not going to want to have like an eight foot, a bunch of eight foot rods. So there's got to be some kind of specialized kayak, kayak rods out there. And yeah. Well, I right mean, now. I want to preface it by saying that I'm not a, typical kayak fisherman because i stand up and fish most of the time and i i generally use almost the same type of rods i would use out of a bass boat but in general though uh kayak anglers sitting down there are some differences and actually i, I work with cashin um, fishing rods and they they actually have a dedicated series of rods called the ck kayak series rods and they're they're geared specifically towards kayak anglers they're built to be more durable they have a little bit shorter butt section on them and that's one thing you notice uh, sitting down is that that if you got a long butt that you don't have as much room to maneuver your rod around because you're sitting down um, and then also the you want to look at your rod actions because you're not going to be able to hook this set the hook the same way in a kayak as you would if you were standing on the deck of a bass boat for one thing you're sitting down but for another thing the kayak when you set the hook on a fish actually moves towards the fish so you're losing some of your leverage and so um, you got to kind of take that into account when you're picking a rod whereas if you might you might err on the side of a little bit heavier rod in a kayak to make sure you're getting a good hook set um, and maybe you know, I don't have a, I don't have any trouble using longer rods uh, for me personally, but I'm, I mean, I'm standing up a lot. So, um, you know, those are all things to look at. 
Are there any techniques that you're kind of limited to, like, um, like not limited to, but things that are more difficult to do out of a kayak versus a bass boat? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like punching. What? Punch yeah. well, while well, you're gone, he, he said that, that he stands up mainly when he fishes oh, in his kayak. Okay. So he doesn't have that disadvantage as someone who is sitting down the entire time. That makes sense. But I would imagine punching could be difficult. But, I mean, I guess you could still – you could just vertically jig where you're at punching and you yeah. have, you have probably the best leverage at that point because you're going straight up and yeah. they have to drag the, the bobber of the kayak down. True. So I don't know. And you got braid for me. I mean, one of the things I struggle with is a Carolina rig because I have all those rods behind me and mm. I have a really hard time trying to sling that thing because of a long leader, you know, and I don't have any room to like whip it around behind me. So it's, that's, that's kind of been probably one of my biggest struggles for me, but um, you know, I think it's like everything guys kind of get their own way of doing it, like roll casting and stuff like that's a little bit different. And obviously like flipping and pitching is different, but um, you know, it, you, you figure out ways to make it work for you depending on what your style is and everything. But some things definitely are a little bit harder. I mean, I like, I stand up. I feel like if you're sitting down, you don't get quite as good of a, a view of what's in front of you. Like, you know, trying to, to uh, present your bait to targets and stuff. I mean, you're seeing it from a different angle, but. Um, and coming from the bass world, that that's comfortable too, right? Like, yeah, for me that was natural, but um, mm -hmm. I'm just lucky I fell into that kayak and um, it just it was like it just was meant to be because that was my first. I did have a a Hobie for a brief period of time. That's a pedal kayak, and I did not like fishing sitting down. If I had to fish sitting down, I'm not sure I would still be kayak fishing. But um, yeah, uh, st being able to stand up in the kayak is just feel very natural for me. Um, but you know, I'm, a lot of really successful kayak anglers sit down and fish. So it's certainly, everybody has their own style and what works for them. But. Right. The biggest thing that I've, I've had challenges cause I got I don't have a necessarily a kayak, but I've got a layout boat for duck hunting, which is, it's a little bit wider than yours. You said yours is what? 40 inches. Mm -hmm. So my, my kayak, my layout boat's 48 inches, but I can walk to the edge of mine similar to yours. Now I'm six to 250 and I can walk to the edge of mine uh, and not tip, not have any fear. Different platform, but what I what I've struggled with when I'm fishing out of it is when I set the hook, the whole thing like yep, will spin. And it's for me coming from a huh. the boat world, that's super frustrating because now I have to, I don't have a, a trolling motor. I have to re-paddle, reposition. And a lot of times I don't get good hook sets in fish. And I and I I I just attribute to that because I'm not used to setting the hook. So I'm guessing learning to set the hook is the biggest key. Yeah. It's amazing. Even like something like throwing a crankbait, like if you're in calm, like a really calm conditions and you're not, you know, paddling or have the trolling motor on or anything, you're just sitting still. Dragging if you, you, if you just throw a crankbait and you're reeling it, the, the pull of the crankbait will actually move your kayak around it. It definitely has an effect. That was the our first experience down in, in Kentucky on kayaks fishing. I was throwing a chatterbait that evening. And I learned if I wanted to go to another spot instead of paddling, I would just chuck that that chatterbait out there and I'd reel it as hard as I could and it would drag me just <laughs> enough to the to go down the bank a little bit more and I could That's called working smarter, not harder. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Doubling up. I'm ready for fall. Ron. Yes, Ron. I yeah, am um, so ready for fall it it after been, this week. It's been so humid out there. I'm sweating right now and we're inside. So, yeah. You got one more question for him? Yeah. Um, oh, I was going to ask about, is there one tournament that stood out? You've had a really, um, really successful 2022 and 2023. Um, so congratulations on that. But is there... Is there a tournament that stands out where you had maybe a tougher practice and didn't think you had too much to go on and you ended up 
doing better than you thought when the tournament came around? I mean, is something stand out where you were kind of surprised at how well you did in the tournament? Yeah, actually, um, probably the one that first comes to mind was um, this spring we have a tournament that's a, a the, for Moyak. It's they they have their championship in the spring and it's called the Tanny Twenty. It's the top twenty in the Anglo of the Year standings from the previous season qualify for this tournament. It's a no entry fee tournament and we and they have it on Lake Tanny Como. Mm-hmm. And that's why they call it Tanny 20. And it's actually like one of the few tournaments where we do a shotgun start. So everybody takes off from the same spot and it's just kind of like everybody goes all at once. And it's, it's kind of a, a, it's a prestigious thing to qualify for. And it's also like fun and there's camaraderie because everybody's there together, which usually we're all spread out all over the lake at different boat ramps. And this tournament, we're all there in the morning. We're all taken off from the same spot. So that's really cool. But this year was crazy. I was so I was down at Lake Chickamauga for a week because uh, I qualified for the Bassmaster National Championship and I, I competed in that down there. And I literally uh, didn't know if I was going to even be able to make it back for the Taney 20. I thought I might end up missing it, but I left right away and I drove back and I got back uh, the night before like late. And um, so this was in the spring. We, we were getting a ton of rain and it was flooding down there actually. And Taney Como had come up that Friday, like it was blown out. It was like, you know, Taney Como is usually like crystal clear water and it's known for big fish and you can see them, but they're hard to catch. And, uh, you know, it was like blown out, trees floating down the, the lake. And we didn't even know if we were going to be able to have the tournament. But evidently that lake settles down pretty quick. And luckily Josh Booth, he's a great tournament director. He was experienced enough to know that the lake was going to settle down. And he didn't cancel the tournament. And he just watched it really close. And the, the water got back down to a reasonable level where it was safe that next morning course the lake was really dirty but it's like it already started to develop some mud lines and stuff where you had like a section of clear water and then you had um like you could look out in the middle of the lake and you'd see a like a defined line of clear water and dirty water so it was a really it was like not something you could prepare for most of the guys didn't even really get to pre-fish much because it was like ridiculous the day before so i just went out there you know and and had no idea how I was going to catch them, if I was going to catch them. Taney Como is usually like super clear water and you're like throwing like wacky rigs and stuff, trying to catch these finicky bass. And I I got on this bite and it was an absolute beat down. Um, I think I had, I can't remember, but I want to say it was like, it was high nineties for my biggest five. And then I was within a quarter inch. The guy in second place was a quarter inch behind me. Third place guy was like right there behind him. So several of us got on really good bite and um, I was catching them on a chatterbait. It was a lot of fun. And like Josh said, those big fish down there in Taney Como, when it gets dirty like that, they just get stupid because usually they're like really hard to catch and, that water is all dirty and they just got shallow and they got, they got dumb and they weren't everywhere. It wasn't easy. Some guys didn't even catch any, but um, I found two areas that had uh, like roads that had drain culverts underneath where water was running in. And it was a little clearer in those areas. I mean, it was still stained, but it wasn't like as dirty as the other areas. And they were just kind of stacked in those areas. I just kind of rotated all day long And that was just kind of a cool deal. I ended up winning that championship tournament. I kind of figured them out on the fly. It took me a little while. I mean, like the first hour, I don't think I caught anything. And I was just rotating through baits. And finally, I got on this chatterbait bite. And, um, you know, it was after that, after I caught a good one on that that first one on the chatterbait, I just stuck with it the rest of the day. And it was a lot of fun. Do you... Did, did anybody else catch them on a chatterbait? Somebody I else think catch- I think most of the people that were catching them. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I I know a number of people were catching them on chatterbaits. Okay, that's cool. I, that's the lake that. Where did you guys put in at? 
At uh, Rockaway Beach. Rockaway Beach. It's right there by, I think, is that uh, we, Bull, Bull Creek, I think? We can stop talking about Canacomo. <laughs> <laughs> We yeah, don't, we don't hey, need we to mention, make that trip. I've we don't need to make, stuff. mention any more about Tanacoma. Yeah, it's a trout fishing. It's we just have trout fish. it's just a trout fishing lake. Yep, that's all it is. Uh, Moyak has a. Uh, you're you're, you're going to hate me for this, but Moyak has a, um, a, a competition they started this year, which is the big bass of the year, and you sign up for it, and it's a separate event, and it runs the full season, and you submit your biggest fish. And whoever, you know, has the biggest one at the end of the, the season wins. And right now, 23 inches is leading, and it was caught on Tanny Comos. Man, that's a good fish. That's a solid fish. Yeah, it was like, and it was super fat, too. I mean, it, the length doesn't even really do it justice because of how fat it was. I mean, it was, it had to be close to an eight pounder. I don't remember if the guy measured it or not, but I'm thinking it had to be like an eight pounder. But that's the downsize of the measuring the length versus the actual weight. Right. Because I mean, I've caught we've all caught I've 20, caught 20 20 minutes four, fish I've caught a twenty four inch fish that didn't weigh four and a half, five pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Just a not, sickly fish that, that you lucked into. You know, you a twenty-four a, inch fish in a kayak tournament is going to win. Yeah, you know, about ninety-nine percent of the time. It's just a so. What, what is your what's your record length of five in a derby or a monthly? Well, like, um, in a like a monthly, like the the monthly online tournament, which you have the whole month to catch your biggest five. I can't remember exactly, but it's in the neighborhood of one hundred five, one hundred six, something okay. like that. The the record for Mo Yak, I think, is right at around 110 inches uh, okay. for the biggest five for the month. Um, Gosh. And, you know, it takes for those monthly tournaments, um, like every month, it takes right around at least 102, 104, somewhere in there, and, and sometimes more, um, and almost always to, to win those. And, if you're not catching fish 20 inches or better, like your biggest five, all of them being over 20 inches, you're not going to really be competitive in those. Is that a winner takes all, or do they have second, third place in those? Yeah, it's 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 just like any other tournament. It depends on how many people are in it. I mean, we're probably normal is around 30 or 40, and if there was, they do one for every 10. So usually it pays three or four places plus a big bass and the big bass is $2 or $10 per person. So, you know, if you got 40 people, it's 400 bucks for big bass. And then if you win, you know, you're probably going to, you know, you can, I mean, I've easily won uh, close to a thousand dollars before in a monthly tournament. If you have, you know, a pretty good number of people. If you win what's, big, what's big bass in first place, uh, you know, right around fifty bucks. Yeah, that's not bad. Fifty yeah. bucks a month to fish. I mean, thousand, yeah, it's pretty reasonable. Thousand bucks. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. I like that. I like the collective five fish. It doesn't have to be out of the same body of water. You can, you know, go. You can pick and choose the lakes and pick and choose the days and stuff. And yeah, yeah, it's things. great. Great for people that you know that can't. Like they they got to work on the weekends or, you know, if you just you can get out in the the evenings and, you know, just fish lakes that are close to you, like public water, and, you know, it's a good it's a good option for some people that just can't do the live tournaments. So. Well, and you don't have to have a, an old town power drive kayak either. You can go out and the, the hundred dollar. Well, the guy I was talking about, Josh, that fishes Cedar Lake. He's one. He this, this is Illinois. But he's won, he's won a ton of those monthly five fish tournaments, yeah. and he's fishing out of a. It's a twelve or fourteen foot kayak, but he it, but it, there's no pedal drive, there's no trolling motor. He's actually using a paddle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could you could essentially go to your local lake in a two hundred dollar kayak from Walmart and and win one of these tournaments. Oh yeah, for sure. We've got. One of our uh, best anglers in Moyak, he's won Angler of the Year more times than anybody else. Um, that's actually the guy that finished. I beat him by a quarter of an inch. His name's Dorman Huey at that Taney 20. 
and he fishes out of a like a 10 foot paddle kayak no electronics you know handful of you know probably three or four rods and a crate little milk crate to tackle and he'll go out and kick your butt more times than not and he you know he's really good at fishing those skinny water areas that are way back up in a creek somewhere and um you know he's figured out how to make that small kayak be an advantage and you know that you you see people be competitive in all different kinds of kayaks so you definitely don't have to have the biggest most expensive one to be successful yeah um last question right here stephanie we've got to wrap this up uh chad would you ever consider changing from a kayak to a boat and why or why not well, I mean, I've been down that road. I've fished out of a bass boat for over 20 years and it was great for me. Um, I had a lot of, I have a lot of good memories, but I really, right now, I don't have any desire to go back to that. I don't. You had a lot of success out of a bass boat too. Out of a, yeah, I, yeah. I did. I mean, I, I won, I fished a lot of those years. I just fished local club stuff and I had seven angler of the year titles over the years. And then I fished some various, um, you know, I fished BFLs and Toyota series and stuff as a co-angler and then also fished BFL as a boater a little bit. And I fished solo pro series and I, uh, was just, I ended up second to Bobby Albert and solo pro one year, almost one angler of the year in that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I did have some success. Um, I feel like I've had more success out of the kayak and, um, the thing I, I just, that I don't miss at all is how involved it is with a bass boat as far as maintenance and repairs and all of the expenses and gas and oil. Yeah. And it's so it's, it takes up so much room at your house and um, just, I, I, I have more fun and catch just as many or more fish out of my kayak. And it's just so much, less it's less cost it's i'm able to i didn't ever want to travel around and fish big tournaments out of my bass boat just because i was intimidated to go to these lakes across the country with my bass boat due to the cost and also not knowing the lakes and afraid i'm going to damage my boat and it was just intimidating but with a kayak i mean i've been all over the country you know gunnersville and chick and i've been all the way you know, I'm going up to Wisconsin. I've been Arkansas and Kansas and all over the place. And, and it's just not intimidating to go out in a kayak because there's not much that can go wrong. I mean, unless the weather's really bad and you just, and it's not expensive, you know, I can afford to do that now because I don't have all that extra cost. So. Yeah. Solid answer. Um, well, let's wrap this up. Thanks for coming on it was good to catch up with you um man it was great good, good luck with everything coming up and have fun up north Je jealous um, of the north trip yeah sure. it's gonna be fun uh any any shout outs before we go yeah i mean i mean i i'm lucky to have great sponsors of course crock gator and h2 bait design uh old town kayaks everhearts outdoors dungarees clothing here in columbia is a big sponsor of mine cash and rods crank wraps gorilla grip i'm fortunate fortunate to have a lot of support and i really appreciate all that i appreciate you guys having me on it's always a blast and um i could talk about fishing all night long as i'm sure you could but we got to cut it off somewhere so yeah yeah man it's i i've enjoyed it man it's been a great conversation and we'll do it again before long and uh good luck out on your fishing adventures thanks everyone for hanging out with us tonight there's a lot of really good conversation it was a nice tight little intimate group and I, I i like these kind of streams we're gonna do these on tuesday nights for the next couple months Just and trying to i fill hope it out. See if yeah, it we're gonna fill it out and um hopefully we've seen we've seen several new faces hopefully you guys will stop back next tuesday uh congratulations to tom for the win on Jones. the crocodile gator stuff yes gonna get some stuff that's not even out on the market yet he's probably going to be posting all kinds of fish pictures and not showing the bait and not talking about the bait so but uh that's all we got for you thanks chad um good hanging out with you and we will see you guys next week. time everybody good luck out